Okay. So he didn't oh. get all that chatter before. Okay. So the recording is on. Terrific. Well, thanks everyone for coming back. Uh, I definitely second some of the sentiments from this morning that um, life is good, things are going well, and I'm very grateful for your time and effort in working through uh, so many tables. So um, we were uh, we were thinking about this yesterday after the meeting, Sarah and I, and we were looking back at these objectives, and we were kind of a little bit concerned that we were that we were making our lives more complicated than they needed to be by starting to break things out and switch everything into two objectives, short term and long term. And so we looked back at the notes from the last meeting where we developed these objectives, and we realized that we think that you guys already sort of built this long-term and short-term thing into your objectives. And that's really good. So that might save us a lot of time and uh, save us some complexity. So um, what I did in the screen that you're seeing is I added this red text so that maximizing satisfaction for lion hunter opportunity now specifies long-term and maximizing satisfaction for harvest of lions now specifies the next six years during the study period uh, or, or until the next study period. So I think that this reflects my understanding of the conversation that was had around the objectives. If you guys agree, then we can really quickly update the scores for just these two lines, and then we can move forward with the discussion. But you guys have to agree before we can do that because this has to come from you. And this is just me trying to reflect back what I uh, think that we've heard from you. So I wanted to put that out there for discussion to see if folks are comfortable with this, if having um, this change captures that conversation around long-term and short-term, and if folks are ready to move forward with that. So um, the, the floor is now open to discuss that and I leave it to you guys to, to see how that, what you think about it. I'm good with that. The only thing I would say, just reading it, it seems like, you know, on the next six years, that's all we're, you know, we're basically going, well, we want maximum satisfaction for the next six years. Is the only thing I would see with that little question mark at the end, what happens after that? We start our new cycle. So that's, that's right, and, and FWP folks can weigh in, but after six years, I think this process is scheduled to happen again. And so um, what I'm- That would be my only, my only hang up on it is to make sure that that's what, you know, that's what we're putting out there. So Jason, would the, would the row above that for maximizing um, satisfaction for lion hunter opportunity, if we put long-term greater than six years, does that, Kind of help address your your concern. Yeah, you know, it just uh, it's just like we're looking at the opportunity as a long term feature, but we're looking at just harvest in the next six years. Just reading it, you know, that's what it seems like it comes off to me. And I can see where you know you go. Well, what about the six years after that? And if that's you know what we're talking about, then that'd be fine. You know, in six years, it'll be reevaluated uh, and there'll be a new plan in place. Would it help at all to put um, this into the measurable attribute column instead to say, here's actually how we're measuring it. So these are the objectives, but we're going to talk about this happening either beyond six years or within six years for each of those. Just I, am I hearing kind of like a concern with sounding like we only want to look at harvest within this first six years and to heck with everything after that? Yeah, that's what it comes off to me as is, hey, the opportunity is great because we're thinking long term, but the harvest, we're only thinking short term is what it just, you know, looks like to me, you know, how it's there. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that's my feeling. Sure. My perception of the objective of Lion Hunter opportunity. Um, kind of encompassed more like 
your your opportunity would would be like a tag in your pocket so um you know more opportunity would be like you know like for example uh a quota system would actually give more people opportunity to harvest than say a a special draw but to maximize the satisfaction and the harvest of lions is actually like the success of the actual hunt and so that's why i think it kind of played out in that the different prescriptions a little different was because you may get a really good harvest of lions because you're going to a lot more quota um and for um but there's going to come a point after two three years after you've removed say an extra you know 30 percent of individuals out of specific lion management units that the success then after that two three year period once you've removed that excess is goes way way down because you're looking for less individuals so i didn't really see the opportunity as a long term and the harvest of lions as a short term necessarily i think they both kind of encompass both long and short term but i might have been seeing that incorrectly well, thanks for that perspective casey that definitely helps um so yeah i mean we can keep we can tweak it further i think the idea is that um we we sort of want there's a downside to having too many objectives and um, and kind of adding too much complexity. So if we have everything being short term and long term, so yeah, this was my way of trying to kind of compress the short term and long term into one row each. Um, so maybe another thought, and again, this is you know this is uh, just me making suggestions that I that I hope reflect conversations that you guys are having, but um, we could have lion hunter opportunity and satisfact or and harvest uh in the short term as one line and opportunity and harvest in the long term as a second line so i i don't know you know if those i don't know if those two things the opportunity and the harvest are so similar in how they would play out under each alternative that they could be combined um or not so that's a question that i'll put to you guys sorry if that didn't make sense i'm happy to rephrase all right, going back to January, we started out with a uh, maximized satisfaction for ungulate hunters and maximized satisfaction for lion hunters. So it was decision of the committee to break out those lion hunter categories. I don't know if anyone remembers that or if anyone can talk to why we broke those out. I think it's because, like, like I said, that my perception is that hunting opportunity and the actual harvest of lions are two distinctly different things. Um, I know they're similar in a lot of ways, but they do play out in different, in different ways. Um, if, if you give, if you let 500 people go after 10 individuals, your satisfaction of harvest of lion is going to be poor for all but those 10 individuals. If you give out 10 tags for 10 individuals, then the, the opportunity is very poor, but the harvest is success potentially is very good for those individuals, if that, if those actual hunters of those lions. So they, they can play out in two different, different ways. With a, with a large population of lions and a small quota, your harvest of lions is going to be you know, uh, uh, quick, but there's a lot less opportunity with less you know what less quota so i think they're they can be seen as distinctly different things but they do obviously track together in some in some of these prescriptions but in some of these other prescriptions they begin to fall apart in the and how they track together yeah and i see that too you know that totally different you know uh, those two things a harvest and opportunity because you know really an opportunity is a tag in your pocket now you might be in a draw area but you can purchase an over-counter tag and be able to you know archery hunt if you see one or just you know during rifle season too you know it's an opportunity in case you see one 
is some of the way I sort of look at the opportunity is just ha- being out there and having a, you know, having a chance. Would it help at all to change that measurable attribute then for opportunity to a number of tags? I don't know if that clarifies anything or gets us further towards or away from where you're trying to head with this, but that is an option as well to totally change how we're measuring these things, if that would help at all. Again, I think the opportunity, you know, some of this is totally season structure too. I mean, if you have a bad seat, you know, a poor season structure, you're not going to have much opportunity. I know we're not supposed to talk about season, but I'm trying to get it in there any way I can. <laughs> yeah. Yesterday, Neil said, suggested maybe we should just leave leave the variability in there because we all kind of think about these things differently so maybe we don't have to get so specific just call it call it opportunity and call it harvest and we think about it however we want to think about it and go i think that was kind of my sentiment is is that it already kind of reflects our different perspectives and the numbers that were given in you know, the last time, Um, you know, because we all do have a little bit different perspective on that. That's what's being shown in that graph is our, is our difference in perspective, which is, I think the healthy attribute. Agreed. I agree with that too. I would agree with that. Agreed. A lot of agreement there, which is great because we have all that data ready now. Um, Does anyone disagree and want to make sure that we um, reflect this long-term, short-term question more explicitly? Or is everyone happy with that kind of being built into to the uh, objectives we have here? So you'll leave out the number of tags available. Yes. It's in red there. Yes, exactly. Okay. I'll agree. It looks good. Yep. I like it. It's good for me. Okay. Fine with it. I'm good. Well, if that's the case, folks, I think we are good with what we've got. And I can stop sharing my screen and pass it over to Sarah, who can show you uh, show you the results then, because we've got them now. So um, from here, we can kind of switch gears, stop fiddling with the rows and the columns here, and start moving the conversation toward what recommendation this group is going to make. So um, when Sarah's ready, she'll uh, share her screen and we can start shifting to that direction. All right, you wanted me just to go to the final table since we were about to look at that yesterday, right? Yes, that would be great, yeah. All right, let me know when that comes up. I can see it. Okay. So this includes your latest scores from yesterday, late in the day, and your weights from late in the day. Um, Those haven't changed terribly much, as you can see. They do now sum to one since we removed that objective two there. Any surprises or 
thoughts on this latest table? I think that tracks with what what my expectation was or what I expected to see with that you know that that redo there but I agree with Casey that's uh, all along though those were the two status and minus 15 is where I thought we should be I don't think there's any surprises. It's kind of what I thought too. <clears throat> so Sarah, as a next step, what do you think is the most useful place to start the discussion? Should we look at individual objectives that we might be able to tweak? Or should we start thinking about alternatives to, to raise for discussion? Or what's, what's your opinion of the next best place to go in the process here? Really, however the group would like to proceed. Um, and there's clearly the plus 10% is clearly not a winner here. The other three are really quite similar overall. Of course, negative 30% is a bit less and you see more red cells, which is telling us that it's doing a bad job and several objectives. So that might be one you can say, we don't necessarily need to keep considering further, but let's look further at those middle two columns for status quo and 15% decrease, um, since they each have some trade-offs there, as you can see, um, comparing each of these pairs of scores and the color shading there is showing us how each one gains and loses a little bit of ground on each objective. So yeah, we can talk about whether if you like those two options as a way to move forward and talk about how we might be able to come up with a compromise that satisfies across each objective set. Um, if there's a way to tweak these further and think about it, other improvements we can make to either one to get to group satisfaction. And again, this isn't to make the decision for you. This is just to show you how to talk about the trade-offs involved with going either of the different options you have proposed here. And remember, we can always go back and come up with another alternative that meets the two best ones in the middle, perhaps, or something else that um, anything else you might think of. We're not constrained at all to stick with the set of four options here. Does anyone want to uh, champion any of these alternatives based on what they see or, or suggest rejecting any of them based on what they see? That could be a place to start, provocative <laughs> place to start. Well, the one thing we know is we're not going to make everybody happy. <laughs> we do. And, we knew that from the start. That's right. <laughs> and, and if it were up to me, we'd stay status quo. But it's obviously not up to me. It's up to all of us. It's up to all of us as a as a as, as a consumer and as as, as lion advocates or non lion advocates or unblood advocates. I mean, we have to be at least to the fifteen percent, I think, to make everybody happy. Um. That seems to be pretty, pretty standard going down the thing to me. I mean, it never seems like it's acceptable. What's anyone else thinking? I'm looking at like the outliers there. Um, number seven, recreational line chasing. 
yes, that does pull a lot of the numbers down towards the status quo and away from the negative 30%. But if we represent the population as well as our own personal feelings, if we represent the population, how many people within the population are really out chasing lions for non-harvest? That might be something for some of the, the lion chasers. Josh, you have your hand up, go ahead. Yeah, well, I'm, it's kind of similar to what Tim just said. I, I think these numbers represent maybe some imbalance. Uh, you know, our committee, I mean, I, I'm, I'm honestly surprised we're even discussing status quo and, and I get it, but I think FWP, they probably didn't intend this, but we've got like five, five or six houndsmen on our committee. So we are heavily weighted toward the houndsmen and lion hunters. I'm one of them. I'm going lion hunting this weekend. So I think there's a lot of bias and we may be over-representing um, uh, that user group because when I think about the potential of going status quo, I think there would be such outrage. Uh, I mean, where I am in Northwest Montana, every single person here other than houndsmen is screaming about predators and, and getting our all the predator numbers down, including mountain lions. So for this group to even consider status quo, I'm, I'm having a hard time with that just based on the public sentiment. And uh, so I'm, I'm really kind of looking at that 15 to 30 with the, the focal areas. And, and I, I think maybe it's just a challenge for our committee, the fact that we're, we're like more than half of our committee, you know, houndsmen and lion hunters. So uh, I, I think the, the ungulate hunters are probably way underrepresented. And I think these numbers maybe are showing that a little bit. And the, the last thing I want to say is with those 15 and 30s, since we're going with alternate alternative B, that means we're going to have focal areas. And as was demonstrated by Mike, those focal areas absorb the majority of the harvest. So I think what we're going to end up with is even at a 30, those focal areas are going to absorb a lot of the harvest. There's going to be some areas, some hunting districts that don't see any decrease or maybe even a slight increase to base, uh, depending on how those numbers weighed out and where we have those focal areas. Um, so I'm, I'm really um, advocating for somewhere between that 15 and 30. Well, I, uh, I, I couldn't go with 30 because there's too many unknowns here. For one thing, we don't know how accurate the, the model is. Uh, when I called about 30 hound guys, I asked them, one of the questions I asked them was how many wolf tracks they've seen per cat track. And it went from two to seven with uh, probably average around three. And if you figure that out, that's 4,200 wolves in that Eagle region, which seems pretty high for me too. And then like yesterday, the wolf snares now, there's, uh, seems like they're catching almost as many cats as they are wolves. And uh, none of that goes on the quota. You know, even if the quota is open, when these cats get snared, it's an incidental catch and it doesn't go into the quota. And we don't know what yet what the, you know, whether they're gonna get a hybrid season statewide. Uh, and, and if that goes in, you, we're right back where I was, you know, 16 years ago when I was on that panel, you know, addressing the overruns. And the overruns don't go on the quota either the next year, never has. And never, Bob I talked to said it never will. So, I mean, there is a lot of unknown here. And to jump to 30%, uh, I'm just not comfortable with that. And I agree. And in six years, we'll revisit this. And so it's going to be hard to recover if we go 30% now and we overshoot. Yeah, but remember, it's spread out over five years. It is. <laughs> You're only looking at like five or six percent this first year. It's 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 just not much. When I look at these hunting districts up here, that's these are huge hunting districts, and we're only talking about that would I don't know equate to one or two extra lions harvested across a, a hunting district. It's uh, that number thirty percent. I I feel like it's just because it's the largest one that we're looking at. You know, in some areas, it's not going to be that significant. Benny, go ahead. You've got your hand up. Um, I'll agree with Josh, and a lot of his explanations are going to be the same as mine. 
uh, but uh, I'll elaborate a little bit. Uh, I think the only thing I would think is favorable about the status quo is, is that we went with alternate B, which would allow you to move some of the kill towards places where, well, let's say you've got a, a lions that are particularly targeting bighorn sheep and you know, there, there are places that bighorn sheep have been almost eradicated by, you know, a, even a single cat, like in uh, southwest Idaho down in the Hawaii's with California bighorn. Um, and then also with mule deer. So being able to move, which I know you guys have, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks have wanted to downplay um, as far as micromanaging, but being able to move around the harvest is biggest advantage of the status quo or the only advantage I see of that we're going to tick off uh, most of the population and and maybe just satisfy uh, the houndsmen that are vocal about it like the fellow yesterday that uh, texted in or emailed in um, I'd go with the 15 um, for you know basically the same reasons um, we're going to be able to move some of the harvest around if needed. And it's gonna satisfy more people, but it's probably not gonna have a great impact because wolves are gonna take over. Um, and I don't think we're gonna do that much good for the ungulates, but that's the way it is. If we can't deal with the wolves, we're stuck. So basically I'm agreeing with Josh just uh, expanding on it a little bit. Okay. I'd like to, yeah. oh, I'd, I'd like to speak a little bit towards that. Um, I think, you know, uh, several facets, but um, one of the reasons why you see maybe you see a, a high level of, of uh, lion hunters on this panel is because they are the most knowledgeable, the most um, about the species. And we have our finger on the pulse of actually truly what's going on out there, not just what somebody's game cam showed in their backyard, not just the opinions of a bunch of, of uh, road hunters that haven't been able to kill their elk the last 10 years. And it, it's an educated opinion and obviously we want to see lions on the landscape we want to maintain that resource um, and that's why we're so vocal about it but there also is a sense with which just just because you have you have more deer and elk hunters as a population doesn't mean that they're educated deer and elk hunters as to the actual goings on of the daily what's going on out in the woods like we are and so i think that's that's the reason why they ask for our opinions in this matter. Um, and that's why there is some, some weight towards those, those, those uh, facets, but just my opinion. No, I'm, I'm not sure if it, um, helps everybody's perspective or not, but um, when we were looking at, uh, at the applicants for this group, uh, what we were trying to find was, we weren't trying to stack the, uh, the group with, with uh, lion hunters or hound hunters per se. Uh, what we were trying to do was find people that had, um, number one, they, were, they had a vested, um, interest in the eco region we had a lot of people applied from other eco regions that were highly qualified um, but we wanted wanted people that that participated in the area so they were familiar in the area and um, we wanted people that had demonstrated the ability to think independently and and i you know i'm just listening to the dialogue that you guys are having and i um i think you're you're demonstrating that you know, you're thinking independently, you're not, um, you're thinking more broadly and, and uh, wider in scope. And so, you know, it's most of the people that we selected um, weren't simply 
you know, lion hunters. They were deer hunters that hunted lions. They were elk hunters that hunted lions. Um, and so um, I'm not sure if that helps you um, think about uh, why the agency was, was looking for the group or selected you to be on this group. Um, but uh, um, the fact that you're all uh, demonstrating the ability to think independently is, is in, in my opinion, um, kind of uh, validates uh, your selection to be on the team. Folks, I'm going to turn the um, screen sharing over to Alex here, just so I can um, try prepping something in case we need it. Okay, is everyone seeing my screen now? Yeah. Great. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so I just sent resent over email the um, the cheat sheets for. Um, for the three alternatives, the, sta the stable, the minus 15, and the minus 30. So those will be at the top of your inbox now. If you wanna take a look at those, um, it might help to have those handy now, now that we're kind of getting into the nitty gritty of, of where and how much harvest is happening where. Um, and I don't know if Justin or, or someone else from FWP might wanna comment on, on those patterns while folks have the cheat sheets in hand. Um, Justin or others, do you want to weigh in there? Sure. I mean, one important point, I think, about the, the two decline scenarios, 15, negative 15 and negative 30% target trend at the end of the six years is that uh, when, when we're talking about an eco-region-wide decline, if you look at those cheat sheets, the differences between alternative A and B in terms of the density of harvests or the number of harvests, number of cats that would be harvested in the focal areas versus the rest of the eco region, it's not that great. Um, I don't know if it's just a point I wanted to make because you're talking about focusing the harvest in, in particular areas where there's ungulate concerns. But if you just look at the difference between alternative A and B on those two sheets, and, and even just the one sheet, the negative 15%, the harvest density in the focal area versus the rest of the eco region where there's some flexibility, like Mike talked about, is not very high. And so you will see kind of a region wide the idea would be that in order to make this work, uh, you, would you would have to see a sort of region wide decline. So other than sort of the the wilderness where there's no potential to increase harvest, those backcountry areas we talked about, you probably would see a decline everywhere. I, and not that this is this is not intended to sway your dis decision. I just want to make sure that you're thinking about it accurately. And if if I'm not explaining that well, please let me know. But I just want to make that one point. All right, I'm going to pull up the uh, minus 15 sheet sheet here and share that just so we can all look at it together. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out, Justin. Yeah, so this is just something that became clear to us as we're doing the modeling and it's reflected on the sheet here. Even if you just look at the map at the bottom, you can kind of see it, but you can also see it up in the, in the blue box above in terms of annual harvest density. But with the R1 focal area, so alternative A, that map on the bottom, just distributing this much harvest, quotas this high, distributing it according to the amount of habitat in the gray area would, would put about 41 cats getting harvested in that red outline focal area. And that is in contrast to alternative B, where we say we are gonna have a focal area where we increase the harvest um, enough to cause a decline 
proportionate to increasing the harvest there from the five-year average enough to cause a decline based on what we saw in region two. That's how we came up with that number. The difference there is four lions. And, and so those four lions would have to come from the rest of the gray area. So you see an increase of four lions per year in that red area and a decrease in the sort of the bigger gray area, if that makes sense. So really this is either way that you do this with alternative A, you're probably gonna cause a decline eco-region wide. That's just a point that I wanted to make. Um, again, it doesn't, I'm not trying to weigh in on the right way to go. I just want to make that point so that whatever you recommend, we're on the same page about, you know, what the modeling results represent. And, and Justin, I would just add in that, uh, you know, the, we made an assumption that about a 30% decline in those focal areas. So that's just, again, to inform you about that's where we came up with those numbers is try to estimate what we'd have to harvest in terms of seeing a 30% decline in, in the focal area. Yeah, okay. Thanks for that. Jason, you've had your hand up, go ahead. Yeah, is there any way you can put, uh, put them, uh, both the sheets next to each other? So you can uh, see, I looked at the other, you know, but I'm trying to go back and forth and- Yeah, let me try to do that. Give me one sec. This is coming from a guy who just learned how to raise his hand on this thing. So if you can, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Alex, can we complicate it and see if you could share all three side by side? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's Too what I'm working good. on. Yeah. Okay. Hang on one sec. I, I don't, uh, yeah, let's see. Let me see if this works. Are you guys seeing that? Yeah. Can you see both? Yes. Okay. Yeah, take a look and, and Timothy, you've got your hand up, so feel free to go ahead. Yeah, I guess my question is on the negative 30%. When we look at alternative A, alternative B, the management area drops back to 45.1. Is there a reason why it would stay low if we we're gonna go for negative 30%, why we would stick to 45.1 or is that just an oversight? It, it, no, that just came, it's a practical reality that comes from, so the, the way we did the modeling, remember, was that we calculated what the harvest would need to be eco-region wide in order to cause that 30% decline at the end of six years. And then when you account for the fact that we are unlikely to increase harvest in those backcountry areas along the east side of this map, then it's just a matter of distributing the rest of the harvest, that total harvest to cause the 30% among these areas. And so that 45.1, that's the same number on the right map on, on both of these sheets. That's what we said, if, if we're gonna target this area, that would be how much we would increase it to from the long, the five-year average. Well, it turns out that given the other constraints we have, if we're just distributing the harvest according to the amount of habitat, we would end up putting more harvest in that focal area. So this 30% decline sheet is basically telling you that there's no, there's really no difference. There's, if you're gonna have a focal area, basically everywhere that on the 30% decline sheet, everywhere that there is flexibility to increase harvest in the eco region, is going to be a ungulate focal area. There's no, there's really no sense to defining focal areas because the harvest of lions is going to be enough wherever there's flexibility to harvest more lions that you'll probably cause a decline. Does that make sense, Timothy? Yeah, I, mean, I just didn't understand why we would put 45.1 on that focal area, well, that, whatever random focal area that is, but for, for this, for I think that's 121. Why we put 45.1 on there, but we wouldn't increase that as we increase the entire area, increase that focal area and maintain a focal area, push and it up to 60 or, or whatever. 
yeah, we debated Timothy on um, how to convey this to you. And, and so one of the things we debated was just showing you one map to make this point that when you get to a 30% decline, having the focal area, um, causing a decline in a focal area is gonna happen even without the focal area. But you could, yeah, you could say, instead of the 45.1, which is what we're saying is probably going to cause decline, that's an increase in harvest commensurate with what we what we used in the Bitterroot Valley where we documented a decline in mountain lions. That 45 harvest, you, you could say that instead of that, you would like to increase it and have 65 in there. I mean, this is totally up to you all, but the point is that in that entire gray area, you're probably, this is enough harvest to cause a decline in mountain lions throughout that gray area. Right, I agree. But what I'm saying is that when you have a 30% decrease overall, that focal area becomes like a 25% decrease and everywhere else becomes like a 31, 32%. Right. You hold that number. Yeah, and, and that's that's the point that we were hoping that you would see by yeah. both of these maps. I guess I would I would say a little bit differently, Timothy. So the the forty five harvest in that focal area is designed to cause about a thirty percent reduction. And remember, we have we have different areas over there. And Justin touched on it. So you're looking at this at an eco region level. And so in those wilderness areas where we can't effectively change harvest, what you ultimately end up doing with, with this minus thirty reduction is harvest and reduce at a greater level than 30% in those areas that we can harvest lions. And that's why you see those numbers increase on the map on A, because you're effectively harvesting lions at a rate in those areas where we can actually harvest lions at a higher rate. So you're probably gonna see a reduction of more than 30% in those areas to offset those areas in the wilderness areas where we will basically see no change at all um, because we can't harvest lions. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Absolutely. That's the maximum that we could really potentially pull out of that area. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. I was floundering on how to explain it. You did. It's a lot clearer than what I was trying to say. The way well, I was... Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I saw a hand from Benny before, but then it went down. Benny, do you still have a comment you'd like to add? Uh, no, I figured it out. Okay. Uh, I do have a hand from Josh, though. Go ahead, Josh. Josh. A uh, question for Liz uh, on the Bitterroot study. Uh, it seemed like that study really demonstrated uh, a positive response from the elk. And I was curious, what was the percentage that you guys dropped the lion population for that particular study? Yeah, we dropped at 30% for that study. And, and we, did see, we did see that uh, initial response, kind of short-term increases and elk recruitment and population growth. But then that kind of lessened as the harvest treatment was reduced. Okay, so you kind of front loaded the harvest and you saw an immediate positive response, but then it kind of, it kind of backed off, is that what you're saying? Yep. So the idea being that we would have needed to hold that harvest prescription longer to see more of a long-term response in the elk. Thank you. Um, so was that just I was gonna say, Go ahead. I, I was just uh, wondering if that was a one-year prescription then? I think it was three years. Is that right, Justin? It was actually, it ended up being two years. The original two proposal years. was for three years, but then we actually, the third year, we ran a committee very similar to this, and it ended up changing the season for that third year. So the increase in harvest. Uh, is really what it, Jason, you were on that committee, so you remember that. Uh, say that again. You were you were on the committee that we convened in that third year. Uh, I was curious afterwards what you found out with the wolves. Did it uh, seem like you had more numbers there after you took the you know back the lions off? Oh, did wolf numbers increase? Is that your question? Or did yeah, I was, my wolves increase? And the answer, predation by wolves, we did not see that 
increase. The, I don't think that wolf numbers increased, but Liz can speak more directly to that, I think. Yeah, I don't think we did, Jason. Okay. Um, I can say um, Idaho actually looked at, at predation as well in terms of lion and, and wolf and certainly found, found more effects of, of mountain lions on elk predation. Overall, wolves weren't super far behind, um, but certainly the biggest impact on wolf predation came with reducing pack size. So there's a relationship there. And we have seen, we have seen that happen with wolf harvest over the years. Once we started harvesting wolves, we see an effect that, that we reduce pack sizes, average pack sizes across the state. And so presumably that does represent a benefit, but of course that's just gonna be different from year to year where we get harvest. Um, so it's just, it's one of those things that's pretty, pretty variable. But overall, you know, lions are, are taking both, you know, adult cow elk and calves. Wolves take more calves and older adult elk. So it's a little different effect just in terms of, of what's getting killed as well. Same with black bears and grizzly bears that they take more, you know, neonates than, than anything. So both are important for sure, but um, I think the, the take home is we could expect to see, you know, some sort of response in, in the elk population based on the data that we've gathered by reducing the lion population. And knowing that we're doing what we do on the wolf end in terms of wolf harvest, and if we are reducing pack sizes, that overall that, that has an impact as well. Thanks, Liz. So, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Josh. Grover, we'll get you next. Yeah, I was going to say so, where I'm landing on this all is that um, up here in my area in the, in the far northwest corner, we've got some human conflict around Libyan Troy. We've got a very, very healthy lion population. Uh, we've got some sheep. We've got that social sentiment that wants way less lines. So what I'm going to propose is a, is a focal area up here for districts 100, 101, 102, 103, 104 to try to achieve all those objectives because I, I just don't think a 15% up here in this area is, is feasible. I don't think it will be effective enough. And uh, so that's I'd like to see that 30% up here in those five hunting districts. So that's what I'm going to propose as a focal area for those five districts regardless of whether we end up at 15 or 30 percent. Joshua, looking at 104 and looking how it's only about 12 to 15 miles across, it pretty much the lower line of that is drawn by the Lincoln County, Sanders County line or the Park Fork River and Kootenai River watershed. Does the 104 even need to be a, a district or a unit? Does Would it make sense to merge that with the 121 rather than having a very similar population that's already moving back and forth between those two. A lion on Snowshoe Peak doesn't care which side of the mountain it's on necessarily. It'll probably roam from the Clarks Fork River to the Kootenai River in its lifetime, especially a male. Uh, sure, I'm, I'm just not that familiar with 121, that area, so I, I didn't want to speak to it, but it sounds like you're very familiar with it. So uh, yeah, with the, if you want to combine that in the focal area, that's great. I think it's important to note that under the 15% um, population objective model, you're looking at very close to a 30% treatment of the entire gray area, as well as that red focal area. It's very close to that um, be because that's the only thing that we're affecting. It's not, we're not affecting that gray area by 15%. We're affecting that gray area by, you know, maybe 28% or something like that, which is a drastic reduction in that gray and red area. So I think you're already asking for what these models are showing. Um, you know what I'm saying? you're looking at just a couple, just similar, similar to that other model there to make another, to make a folk area in the northern area would just be a very uh, small number uh, of individuals shifted around. It's not 
I don't, I don't you're not going to see a, an effect on the ground, let's put it that way. Uh, Grover had his hand up a, a little bit ago. Grover, go ahead. Well, I, I, I took it down. I, okay. I was just going to make a comment on the bitter, but it's, it doesn't have much to do with this. So okay. I took it down. We'll, we'll circle back to it. Benny, your hand is up. Go ahead. Well, I think it's admirable that we'll show loyalty to our own individual areas, but I think we're all going to end up wanting to do that if that's what, the direction that this takes. And I think we should leave that up to fish, wildlife, parks, to biologists to decide on because, uh, you know, we're all going to have areas that we want to have as focal areas. And um, I don't know if we should go there. I think we are there, though. I think that's the point in the, the committee now where we have to focus on those topics. I got here a little bit late. So did the committee decide on which alternative they're going to uh, yeah. a prescription? I think that's the first decision, right? Is which, which prescription to uh, adopt or to support? So along those lines, I think um, Sarah just let me know that she's uh, got some new calculations that she might be able to share that might add a little bit of um, clarity or at least uh, open up a, a new kind of discussion. So Sarah, if you're ready to share those, I think we can, we can see them now. Yeah, once you stop sharing your screen, I'll put this up on. So what you're going to see is gonna be, I took um, the group members and kind of split you as kind of the lion hunter type folks and the ungulate and everyone else folks to see if your answers differ. This is based on, I think it was Josh's comment about 20 minutes or so ago about um, the makeup of the group and how we might be able to think about that as we talk about these alternatives. So let me put that up. Let's see. Let me know if you're seeing two side-by-side -side tables now. I am, yeah. So on the left, we have the lion hunter outfitter type folks. And on the right, we have the ungulate hunters and um, any other category that um, you might fall into. And I think what this clearly shows is, yes, if we were to look at just the lion hunters and outfitters um, opinions, then we would see that the status quo is the clear winner in this 30% decline is pretty much a non-starter. Whereas over here for the ungulate hunters, that 30% decline is the preferred one. And these other options are not too far below, but it might, this might provide some clarity on um, how to go about this conversation of how to compromise these different, clearly different sides. And we always knew, I guess, that those probably existed. So um, does this help at all to see, um, to Josh's point about the group makeup and how the broader opinion of and perspectives that the public will have about this group's work and uh, what you propose. I think the only deviation I see is the satisfaction of lion hunter opportunity and harvest of lions. Everything else, we're pretty much tracking the same thought process on. I mean, it does separate those two out and it does tell the perspective, I think, a little bit of the lion hunter, but that'd be the only two areas that really deviates. Thanks, Timothy. So with this information in hand, does this um, imply, this is an honest question, does this imply 
moving away from really thinking about the status quo as the top or near top ranked um, in the previous one uh, with everyone's results and somewhere some percent decline um, without going all the way to the 30 percent. I think it just highlights that we're well represented on both sides. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it stands out. It separates those things, but I don't think it says much other than that we're well represented and that we have a, a good showing of both sides of what we, the community might need. What's kind of interesting here is that under both of these tables, that 15% decline is uh, the same score, kind of middle middle ground for both groups. And that was the, the top ranked one on the previous, if I recall. How about this, um, this line of maximized satisfaction and recreational lion chasing? Lion hunters said basically a lowest score under that scenario, but ungulate hunters said there would still be some value there. So I uh, don't know if anyone wants to speak to that. And I, I do see Gerber's hand up too. So go ahead and uh, go ahead, Gerber. Well, what I was gonna say is the difference between, you know, the lion outfitters, lions and outfitters is, uh, and the uh, ungulate hunters is, uh, as an example, the I, I took a guy out, neighbor that wanted to go take some pictures of some cats, and we went. We cut a lion track up high. It, there's two roads below, and so I went to the next road, and the cat had crossed, and went to the bottom row, and the cat had crossed, and and so we turned loose there and treated. And when we got back to the pick up, uh, he says, "Boy, we sure seen a lot of lion tracks today." You know, and I said, "Well, there's only one." And he said, oh, you think that's the same cat? You know, every time a cat crosses a road, uh, to most uh, deer and elk hunters, it's a different cat, you know? And that's where a lot of difference is between the numbers of, and, and what people think. Yeah, thanks, Grover. I, I see in line, uh, in the line for maximized satisfaction for harvest of lions, for the minus 30, the lion hunters and outfitters gave it the lowest score and the ungulate hunters gave it the highest score. So that might be something to, to talk about and think about how we could reconcile um, and whether that, that compromise in the middle um, might help satisfy both groups or, or not. But um, yeah, I think that, that one's pretty stark. I guess for me, when I filled that one out, <clears throat> I was looking at it, you know, I know if we take a whole bunch of lions in the first couple of years, there's going to be less in the next few years. So the first couple of years might have a lot of satisfaction, but the next couple, the satisfaction may decrease in, you know, the people that are here. But if somebody is coming, you know, from the other side of the state to come hunting, their satisfaction is going to be greater you know, no matter what, as long as they can kill lions, you know, I think for us locally, we're looking at more of a management, but I think people that are drew a tag that aren't necessarily lion hunters, but they want to go out and kill a lion, their satisfaction is more based on the success of it. So it was kind of hard for me to answer. So I was kind of middle of the road there. Sarah, do you have the, um, the kind of total table pulled up that we could look at? 
uh, the combined one. that showing on your screen successfully yeah, there. Yeah, it is, thanks. So, um, you know, one proposal that, that we could do, and this is, this is totally up to you guys, whether you wanna take it or not, is to, to think about that minus 15 as a compromise between the groups represented here, and then to step through the objectives. And for the ones that are low, think about whether there's any changes we could make or, um, you know, shifts, whether it's more or less harvest or other things that could allow us to kind of uh, improve those low uh, numbers in that column. So that's one idea for how to move forward. But um, we could do that with another alternative, or if someone wants to champion uh, an alternative, we can, we can hear that out and, and think about it. So, um, um, so I leave it up to you guys to make that decision, but that's one possibility. Vinny, go ahead. It feels like we're kind of. I guess I don't understand why you want to change. Are you saying you want us to change the weighting of our objectives? No, sorry. I'm I'm saying that um you know we've we've gone through these four alternatives, and these are the results that we've gotten. But let's say, for example, if we looked at objective number seven, maximize satisfaction for recreational lion chasing, that's the lowest score for the minus fifteen percent. So we could talk about whether, you know, changing to a minus 10% or a minus 20% would, um, you know, help rectify that low score. If there's another kind of uh, compromise or tweak we could make that could help, um, you know, address some of these particularly low scores, if that's a, if that's a, a alternative that we're all willing to start with. So yeah, not reweighting anything, but just discussing how we can kind of tweak and compromise and work toward a, the best possible alternative for the group. I, I think I'm gonna, Josh Boltz was starting to talk, I think when I called on Benny. So Josh, if you wanna go and then uh, Jason will get your hand. Um, I was just gonna say, it kind of feels like maybe we're starting to close in around that 15. Um, so I'd, I'd love to go back and look at the numbers again and, and talk about that. Talk about that alternative some more. Okay, thanks, Josh. Jason, your hand. Go ahead. I was just curious if there's uh, any reason why we're keeping the plus 10% on there. Is there anybody, uh, any discussion on that? It's lowest in both, you know, on both categories. Doesn't seem like it's a hot topic. I, I can certainly <clears throat> remove it from the table and it would just change the color shading a little bit, but at least it, right now having it in the table provides that contrast to show that you've thought about all these ranges of options. And it can be a nice thing to show that um, when you report out your results here, we did consider the full range of options um, as a committee and here's why we didn't go with that option. Yeah, I was just curious. I didn't know if we're trying to start, you know, getting rid of them or what we're, you know, what step is next. And I just, no one's really said much on it. So I was just curious about it. Yeah, it's really, I mean, at this point, it's, um, it's your call on how you want to proceed with this information. Um, again, this is clarifying, hopefully for you, how all these different options meet your objectives. And um, yeah, do we we can certainly remove that uh, from a copy of the table and see how that compares just to, to take a look at it. And I'll do that right now, um, if you'd like. Well, if, if it's there for a reason to show that, hey, we thought about that, then I'm fine with leaving it. I just didn't know if we're going, hey, you know, we're starting to crunch time moving on to things. And I just, it was something that, you know, no one's talked about. So I'm fine with leaving it. I just won't pay as much attention to it. Right. I think that we've discussed it and it should be something maybe kept in the records in the background as 
go back and reference later for anybody that questions what we've done here. But I think moving forward, we do have to sort of eliminate some of this to get a better idea of everything else that's still here. Uh, it'd be worth looking at maybe the whole thing without it. Okay. Penny, go ahead. And welcome. Uh, I think that going to bringing up a minus 10% is kind of bringing up an analysis paralysis situation. I recall from our last set of meetings that the difference between minus 10 and minus 15 was, was uh, very, very small. And uh, I would not be in favor of going to the, of going there. Thanks, Benny. So you'll see when we, um, it will adjust everything, right? Because we're stretching those remaining scores out across the range of remaining scores. So we don't see a huge change in these results, I'd say, but yeah, it's, it is boosting that negative 15% option a little bit more by tossing out from this reduced table, that 10% increase option. Cody, I see you here now. I don't know when you were able to join. Thanks for coming. And um, I'm happy to give you a quick summary of what's happened if, if you'd like, or if you feel caught up, we can just keep going forward. Sorry, you're muted. I can see what kind of happened. I feel good unless there's some information you need to share real quick. No, I think, yeah, if you feel good, we're good. <clears throat> I'm going to scroll up to the top real quick just because I want to see. Remember, this objective five was really closely ranked before, and it's right now it's the one cell that isn't um, at least yellow in this middle column. So, just to see, the difference is 0.1 across that. So, I'd say to really understand these results better, removing that objective from our final table will clarify a little bit too, because really there's no variation among these remaining options that you're considering where that objective is going to be satisfied in a different way for really any big purposes, right? Yeah, I and give that a shot. yeah, down here, it's getting 0.13 under the status quo, even though it has 0.1 on a scale of one to five difference in the different alternatives. So just for the sake of comparison, Removing that shows those results. And what's clear to me in looking at this is that that 15% decline is the clear compromise solution because it is yellow across everything except for satisfaction and harvest of lions. So So I'm just, you know, I'm kind of hearing different things from the group and um, I, I feel like, and I could be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like we're sort of as a group starting to move toward talking about this 15% alternative as a, um, as a possible, you know, up for debate alternative to recommend without, without tweaking, as Benny just said. Um, so I'm going to put that forward if anyone wants to, to take that and run with it. But first I see Neil's hand is up. So Neil, go ahead if you... You know, Sarah, I just wanted to wonder if you could explain. So when you remove that one item from the objectives that so the group doesn't feel like it's lost. Basically, what you're saying is that that is something that maybe uh, kind of an overarching objective of mountain lion seasons is to maintain satisfaction. So you, it's not lost to the group. It just becomes something that's common for whatever scenario they pick. And it can yes. be referenced a different way. Yeah. And so as we prepare the final um, document, kind of like the last one that I sent you with all the information about where you had gotten in last um, or the first meeting, first two days, we can show this um, progression of steps. So that was definitely important, but here it actually didn't matter for this particular set of decisions that you're looking at. So we can remove it. So we can kind of step through and make sure that information isn't lost. And it shows that obviously that is an important element to you, but it just didn't vary in this scenario. So 
So th thanks for that additional clarification. I, I think that helps make clear how the process works. Um, yeah, does anyone feel like kind of taking one of these alternatives and running with them or, or making a case for or against? Well, I kind of think 15% uh, is, it looks, it looks like more what everybody's in, in tune with now, you know, and I, I, I'm fine with going with that. Thanks, Grover, for kicking us off. I don't know how much of that last comment, my guy had to reboot my deal, but um, I think it just, just want to make sure it is pointed out. And like I said, this may, maybe this is reiterating, but that 50% prescription is a 25% reduction of, of lions within all huntable populations. It's not, um, so everywhere you go that you're gonna be able to harvest or you're gonna hunt cats, you're looking at that prescription. And so it's, it's a little bit misrepresented a little bit in my opinion um, as a 15%, I mean, ob obviously we're, we're seeing it as an eco-regional level and I, I get all that, I understand the concept, but, but uh, if we're looking at it from populations that everybody's gonna be exposed to, um, you're looking at a 20 plus percent reduction. Are you, uh, Casey, are you getting those numbers because of the uh, back country and then we got the special management and then we got down there at 200, 202, 203? Correct. They won't change? Correct. So to make I'm up for that, that. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm just saying that anybody who, you know, who's, who's, you know, the, the user group who's going to be um, harvesting lions, chasing lions, um, they're going to experience a 20 plus reduction in their lion populations that they're accessing. Yeah, I get what you're saying there for sure. Josh, go ahead. Oh, I, I feel like that's a really important point Casey's trying to make, and I, I need to understand those numbers and how they're applied across the gray area. So could we go back to the, the two maps where it's comparing the 15 and status quo so I can try to understand how this is going to be applied across the region? Yes. Alex, do you still have those ready to, yeah. to show? I'll let you do them. <laughs> and that's good to know too, Casey. Thanks for bringing that up. Can you guys see that now? I think we were looking for status quo in Negan 15. Is that right, Josh? Status quo right. in Negan 15? Okay, hang on one second. Or rather stable, I guess. I had a question too about the focal point. You guys might have touched on it, but that red area now it can be applied anywhere, correct? Except in the green, yellow, and orange. That's correct, Jason. Oh, if no one else was answering, <laughs> um, we use that as an example. There were a lot of different options for where to put that. That was an example, but that is still up for discussion. Okay. But that was selected because there will be long-term ungulate monitoring moving ahead as we develop that Noxin project. So that was just a, an easy example to, to put forward. Hey, Molly, can you explain for the group a little bit um, why it says the negative 15% objective, but killing maybe 20% of the cats? Can you explain that to us so we understand how and why we need to do that? So then, so can you clarify that? So it says negative 15. So that's our long-term population objective change at the end of six years. But what, what was the 20% you were referring to? So maybe Casey, if you can kind of explain what you were coming across. Oh, 
Oh, I see. I think I can answer that. So uh, the point I think, if I'm understanding correctly, that Casey was making is that it isn't an even distribution of the harvest over the entire ecoregion. So proportionally, more of the harvest will be coming from those gray areas or the gray and red. So it will actually feel like a higher percentage um, of lions in the gray and the red, even though the whole composite ecoregion will see that 15% reduction at the end of six years. Is that no. any? Yeah, it? for sure. It, now, well, that wouldn't, why wouldn't that down in that 200, 202 in uh, the Missoula management area, Molly, why wouldn't that apply to that as well if you're wanting a reduction down there? Because aren't those areas kind of your highest numbers that you're wanting to take down anyways? I mean, in, at least in the past? So if I'm understanding you correctly, are you, are you asking why we have a lower number of harvest in the orange and that's not changing? Is that what you're asking? Well, in the, I, I guess my question is, is why would it only apply to the red and the gray? Why wouldn't that be evenly distributed even over the orange and yellow? So in, so in the yellow area, that's the Missoula Special Management Area. And if we look at the average harvest over the last five years or so, um, the 15.2 the is something that we've, we've kept consistent. And for urban conflict reasons, we don't want to change that number. So that will maintain. So we kind of remove that as an area that we're changing, essentially. <laughs> and then in the lower Clark Fork, the orange, we've had historically high harvest there. That's been, in a sense, an ungulate focal area kind of to date. And now we're looking at starting to taper that back a bit without making too big of a change too quickly. Okay. And I just didn't know, like, if you're having an urban conflict, mm -hmm. I, you would think you'd raise that number along with the gray and the red. So mm -hmm. you wouldn't have more urban conflict, I guess. I, I don't know. That was just my theory on that. But So we've had that quota set at, I want to say 25, and Liz can correct me if I'm wrong, and we aren't hitting that quota. It's been set high intentionally to allow for adequate harvest, but 15.2 has been the actual harvest average over those last five years. So we're just looking okay. at, at maintaining that as is. So even if you increase the quota, it doesn't mean that we'll be hitting it kind of like those wilderness areas up in region one. Yep. Yep. Totally understand. And I think the way it was explained to me was, is that was a focal point was the lower Clark Fork for a while. So last time we went through this shift, we really jacked the numbers up on there. <clears throat> then felt like that was probably as high as it was going to go. That's right, Jason. So we've already it's actually a quota 50, but it's the harvest has been the average 35.7 for the last six years, I guess. Yep. So we've already exerted a you know, pressure on that lion population and a decline on that lion population. And that's my backyard. And so that's why I'm more of the stable guy because we have put a prescription in place. So I understand when you guys go, well, 15, 30%, you really want. Uh, so that's just uh, my opinion anyway. Timothy, you've been patient with your hand. Go ahead. Yeah, I guess my question is on the, the red, the 45.1. I understand that, that was just a for example. However, it is red and it does jump out at us. And just wondering where the 45.1 comes from. It seems like somebody put some effort in to come up with that specific number down to the decimal point. But it doesn't follow the trend of 15% or 30%. I think Justin explained that that is a 30% reduction within the focal area. Yeah, is Mike, are you on here? But the 30% reduction was 54 um, on the 30% slide. Yeah, so oh. Mike, I think Mike can explain exactly where that num number came from, that 45.1. But you're generally right, Timothy, that, that the point there was in that is the amount of increase from the recent five year average uh, that would be, um, it's similar to the rate, the uh, percent increase that we used in the beta route. But go, go ahead, Mike. You, yeah, you, that's that 45.1 is. Uh, a jump up to make that zone that's in red. The annual har five-year harvest in that area is 32 lions. 
And we wanted to make that jump up from that regression line we showed yesterday similar to that orange area. So it was a 40% increase in the harvest in order to bump up and make that, that zone proportional to, to what the, the current harvest was down in, the, um, in that orange zone. Yeah, so that, that coincides with just one clarification I wanted to make um, a, couple of, a couple of minutes ago. So, if you look at the left sheet, um, the negative 15% in the blue box, where it, there, it, in the middle of that box on the right-hand side, it says alternative B with R1 focal area. And then there's, there's a table right below that. The total annual harvest would be 232. And then the harvest density in each one of those zones is listed. So under this hypothetical map that we made, you, you would essentially have two ungulate focal areas. The one in region two would continue. Harvest density there would be 2.22 per 100 square miles. And then what Mike just explained, if we increase that harvest density to 45, the harvest in the red area to 45.1, the harvest density would be 2.19. So essentially equal to what we're, we have been doing in, in that region two area that Jason talked about. I mean, that's been going on for quite some time. Does that make sense? Right, I understand what you're saying there. Um, I'm just saying we're talking two different things, I think. Uh, we're saying the red, there was some studies done, and that's the number that was calculated out. And then we're saying the red, don't worry about that. We can put the red anywhere. Right. Are yeah. we really talking about putting the red anywhere? Yeah, we just made the calculation for that one area, which the reason we chose that as an example, like everyone has said, is just because that's where we're, we know we're going to have long-term monitoring. But that is up to you all. I mean, we didn't, this could, that red area could be expanded or it could be a different area. It's up to you. We just chose, because there are concerns with elk there and bighorn sheep, and we know we will have monitoring to track what the effects are on elk and bighorn sheep. But that's not, we're not saying that that's where it has to be. Right, but we are saying the committee needs to be discussing that where it needs to be. Right. All right, thank you. I think it makes a lot of sense to, to leave it there. I think those, those, those areas are struggling and, and with the monitoring, that it's going to give a lot of really good pertinent data for uh, when we revisit this discussion. Is that where the study is next? Is in the red area? <clears throat> right now, there's going to be a study between Prospect and Heron, and they're going to call our wolves, lions, bears, elk, elk cows, and calves and determine what's harvesting and consuming elk. So I'm in huge favor of that red zone staying where it's at uh, just because of the ungulate levels need a little bit of a reprieve. All right. I'm in favor of it staying there also. Uh, like I said, I'd just like to add that strip of 104 either to the zone or just entirely into 121. Timmy, maybe let's ask the biologist, like if Mike's on the, the call still, it would that be an option? Is that an area of concern as well, Mike, is 104? I don't hear Mike, but um, at the same time, that's what I was saying is that narrow strip is the same population. It's, Sorry, guys. The um, top border I'm, is the river, and the they're not down there on the river. So, I mean, it's really maybe 12 miles wide when you start talking about where the population living in the mountains there. I'm here, guys. My IT guy is trying to fix something on my computer at the same time. So, I had my mute on. Um, can you, Timothy, can you, or um, Cody, can you repeat your question for me? So Timmy, Timmy was asking why 104 couldn't be added into that red zone. 
and I said that was more probably a question for you um, if 104 should or could be added into that red zone for the lines there. Yeah. Right. I'll, with the I'll, southern um, edge of the, Mike, with the southern yeah. edge of the 104, pretty much drawing that line between Lincoln County and Sanders County or between the watersheds of the Clark Fork River and the Kootenai River and being <laughs> so narrow in the, in the top end of that bordering the Kootenai River, it's really the same population of lions. It's a very narrow strip that runs through there. Why is it broken out? Is it just because the county line in the watershed or does that make any sense? Should the 104 be included in 121? Included in that, that focal zone, is that what you're asking? Or just merge together as one zone. It's the same population. I, I could actually answer that because, uh, you know, that's actually in different districts biologists. So 104 actually in terms of ungulate densities and ungulate composition is, is quite different than 121. Um, you see different habitat types. It's wetter. Um, when you pop over on the southern part of the cabinets and into the Thompson Falls area, it's a little bit drier. And that's why we... we we uh, kept that as it was. So we actually went through this exercise for ungulates, trying to determine which districts we could combine. And we made a, con a conscious decision to keep that different. Because even if, especially for elk, if you look at elk densities and numbers, it's quite different from 121. I appreciate that, Neil. Yeah, I was a part of the ungulate one also, but um, I was just, you know, if the ungulates and the, uh, is it the, the lions at that same population? Because it's just such a 15 mile strip and ungulates might not move that far necessarily, but the lions, those, especially those toms, they're gonna range up and down from the flat, from the Clark Fork River to the Kootenai River. And a 12 mile strip doesn't make much sense in managing a population when you're talking mountain lions to me. I'd have to disagree with you, Timothy. Those lions that are living on that side stay on that side. And obviously there's some some travel, you know, and some of those end up in Canada, some might end in New Mexico. But the point being is that those those are distinct, different populations of lions, different populations of ungulates, and a different, the success of the ungulates on that side are very different than the success of the ungulates on the southern side. Okay, so, so I understand that then, and I understand the ungulate thing, um, the ungulate population. But then there's the other thing is the human conflict that still exists in 104 south of the Kootenai River with the population of lions there is near the towns. I've hunted a lot of 104. And can you, can you explain to me the exact, like how many conflicts are we dealing with here? And, and are those conflict lions going to be taken care of with a prescription across all of 104? I, I don't see that being the case, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't, I, you know, human conflicts almost always to do with ungulates being in the area. And if there's ungulates in the area and you have a little bit of human conflict as far as, as um, lions being removed or, or eating somebody's cat or eating someone's dog food or whatever, then that means they're there because the ungulates are there. So I don't know what the argument is. We have lots of ungulates. And usually when the fish and game takes care or the, or the, or the, or the stock growers association takes care of, an, of a lion, it doesn't go on the count anyway. You don't see it. And you know that's happening some. I guess that, that was my point too, is that, you know, those, uh, if you've raised a prescription, they're going to harvest more lions out of Miller Creek and, and Bear Creek and Libby Creek and all of that. That's where the bulk of your extra, extra harvest is going to come from. It's not going to come from suburbia Troy. I'm not saying that somebody might not be able to, but as long as you have deer in people's backyards in suburbia Troy, you will always have lions in people's backyards in suburbia Troy because there was lions there a hundred years ago in suburbia Troy. There just wasn't people there. And so I don't think you're ever going to remove that conflict dynamic in a place like Troy, Montana. All right. No, it's an increase in uh, recent time, but the fact is that one of our objectives is to address human conflict. And if it's, happening there and we need to address it as part of this committee then this would be one of those areas that we could as a committee affect what our objectives are that's that was my discussion is that conflict the conflict will not be adjusted by a different prescription in region in 104 
Vinny, go ahead. Well, since we've gone in this in this direction, I'm going to put in my two cents for the Whitefish Range front and the Galton Range front. And I'd be interested in Terry Comstock's comments on on that as far as the focal area. Um, I don't. I'm concerned about you've got a hotbed for chronic wasting disease where you're talking about and you're gonna decrease the lion kill there. Um, that's a, a concern to me. So folks, I wanna step back for one second because we're starting to get into the weeds of where to put focal areas. And, and that's a really important conversation, but I wonder if it's a conversation that should happen after we've made a kind of broader selection about which direction to go with these alternatives. Um, so maybe as a quick, exercise before we take a short break. Um, folks can take um, one or two minutes. You can write down if you want. You can just take a minute to think. Um, this 15% objective seems to kind of be emerging and, and there seems to be some, some momentum building around that. Um, so just take a minute maybe to think about that. And if there's uh, anyone who would object to that um, or be uncomfortable with some part of that, um, Let's all take a minute and think if, if that's an alternative that uh, we as a group and you as individuals can get behind. And then maybe let's come back, discuss that 15% alternative, whether that's something we can kind of um, start to circle around, and then we can return to this discussion about focal areas um, after that. Does that sound good to folks? Take a minute to kind of think that over. All right, thanks everybody for uh, thinking that over for a minute. Does anyone wanna share what they thought about or wrote down um, any strong feelings one way or another about this 15% alternative?
Uh, Josh, I see your hand. Go ahead. I guess I would say I'm okay with the 15% moving forward, but it's starting to look like half of our eco region is going to end up as a focal area. So I'm not sure what that's going to mean for the other half of the eco region uh, as it applies to 15%. So sure we can move forward, but we, we might end up having to tweak the, the, the 15% somehow. So that's, that's what I can. Thanks, Josh. Terry? Um, I just want to remind, you know, everybody what Casey's been saying. That, uh, that it's, it's, it's more like 26.5% as it is when you go to 15% anyway. And, you know, Joshua, and all due respect, man, I mean, I hunt 109 and I hunt 100. Gosh. I hunt 109 and 100 as much as anybody. And, uh, the, you know, the lions aren't there like you think. Um, that's just my opinion. Um, you talk to all the lion hunters, I agree with Grover. I've talked to 10 lion hunters in Lincoln County since the last meeting, and they aren't finding any tracks, I mean, to speak of. So it's, they're around, the tracks they are finding are close to town. I will agree with Timothy on that, but they're around town because the deer are there. And I just think that if we go anything beyond this, you know, we're, it's dangerous, it's a dangerous tide. That's just my opinion. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Terry, uh, I, I just have a different experience and folks that I talk to just just a different story, but I, I, I do appreciate your experience. Thanks, Timothy. Yeah, I think um, what we'd also discussed with the red was that there was a maximum population you could expect to pull out of there. So even if we looked at 30 percent and it went up to 54, you really couldn't expect to pull 54 out of there because of access. But whenever we look at 15% decrease across the board, that still is a considerable amount of decrease to spread through the gray when compared to the, um, what's the other one here, the 0% alternative A. When you put in that 15% with the alternative B, that's a big change from, uh, from 92 lions to 131 lions in the gray area. So we're still pulling a lot from that population. And I think that's good. I, I don't think that uh, there's too much of a difference in the gray. Sorry. Uh, without that management unit. And I don't think there's too much of a difference in the gray if we're going with uh, alternative A. But I think 15% with the management unit is something that benefits the health of the population of the ungulates throughout and human conflict and meets all those requirements. But I think 0% is a big, in the gray area, 0% is a big drop in hunting in those areas that I see as, as an issue with lions right now. I think it's a win-win to go with 15%. Yeah, I just wanted to speak and kind of reiterate a little bit what Terry said there. Um, and, um, is that it, I think there's a misconception too that there's a lion around every bush in all of region one. And it truly isn't that way. I mean, go look at the success of tag holders and stuff and, you know, why aren't they just shooting toms every time they go out? It, it, there's a misconception between, um, uh, of densities and, and Grover's hit to that, Terry's hit to that. Um, this 15% um, region-wide, eco-region-wide prescription, I feel is, is gonna be overly aggressive in all of the huntable populations. Um, based on what I've seen over the past 23 years of watching populations ebb and flow, it's a, it's a drastic treatment. Wally, go ahead. A uh, quick question on the annual harvest at zero percent of what 
fish and game has had on a common over the last five years, that was the average. I guess I have a question for the biologists. What were the tags issued over those last five years? Did we meet quota in those areas? Uh, how, many, how many tags were issued for Eco Region 1 compared to our annual harvest over the last five years? Yeah, I can answer that, <clears throat> at least for Region 1. Uh, region 2 is a little bit managed a little bit different. So we were under a special lion license. So it's a limited lion license. So we didn't have quotas um, in those areas. We basically issued lion licenses based on percent fill. And it was highly variable depending on which area you're at and the amount of road access. So, so our goal was to just manage by selling licenses, not managing to a quota. Does that help? Yeah, so I guess the question would be is if, if we increase 15% from an average harvest of 176 lions over the last five years, and now we're going to increase that to 232. Is the question is, is are we going to kill them? I, I do think that's a question. Even if you look back at that graph uh, where we we uh, where we got the average, there's annual variation within those numbers. So it's going to go up and down depending on the year, um, snow availability, those kind of things, different things that ha can affect it. Um, but you know, that's the question. I think in some areas we definitely would kill, um, additional lions. We've, you know, back in the early nineties, early to mid nineties, where we uh, were actively trying to reduce lion numbers, we killed a lot of lions and we were very successful at it. Um, so I think there's a possibility of doing that. Um, the other thing I'd like to kind of point out for folks to be thinking about a little bit is if you look at the, the 15 point, the percent reduction between options, alternative A and B, um, we are talking four total lions difference between the, those two numbers um, on, on how you apply those. So technically they're not any difference on the landscape. So in other words, alternative A, if you look at our focal area, that's four lions. Um, if you go back to all our, excuse me, alternative B, if you look at that, that's four lions difference between A and B in the focal area. Um, basically, what you're doing, you're just moving four lion harvest across the landscape, which I would say biologically has no is not significantly different. I agree, Neil. However, when we look at alternative B for the zero percent, we drop that gray area from 131 down to 75. Yeah, it definitely it's definitely a difference in the zero percent if there's no if you have no change of stable population. But at the fifteen a fifteen percent reduction, you're talking four lions spread across a huge area. Um, so there's really fundamentally no difference between A and B on a fifteen percent reduction. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I'm just saying for the gray area though, when we're talking zero percent to fifteen percent, when we're focused, I think right now on alternative B the gray area is the only place where there's any variability. And that variability is from 131 to 75 or vice versa, 75 to 131. Yep. Yeah, I definitely agree if you're, you're talking about differences between stable and 15% and reduction. Yep. So folks, I'm going to suggest we take a short break now. Um, I think we've made a great amount of progress this morning. So that's fantastic. And then um, when we come back, we'll continue kind of moving, um, steering the ship toward selecting an alternative, tweaking that alternative to, uh, to the group's liking and, um, and keep this conversation going. So let's meet back at 15 after. See you then.
All right, folks, if you're in the neighborhood, if you can hear me, come on back and we'll restart once we've uh, assembled. Alex, I've got a question. I don't see, not that I want to see it, but I don't see myself on the screen. Is, does other people or what? I can't we hear you. We don't see your photo, Grover, um, but, uh, but we certainly hear you. There's a little button in the bottom left that says stop video or start video. If you try clicking on that, it might uh, it might bring you back. That's my only suggestion. But otherwise, we can hear you fine. Okay, so folks, we'll get started again. I think most of us are here. Um, yeah, we're in the home stretch now. So um, let's keep the conversation going and work toward choosing an alternative and uh, thinking about how we can um, uh, tweak it or not tweak it to, to make sure that we're uh, satisfying folks and minimizing any um, issues. Um, does anyone have any thoughts from over the break that they want to share? Or Kick the discussion off with. Sorry, my audio was a little funny there. Could you repeat that, Alex? Yeah, I was just inviting anyone who had uh, thoughts or comments from over the break that they wanted to kick us off with. And I see Wally's got a hand up, so I'll go to him. Yeah, if I go back to that chart, um, between our status quo and our 15%, I was looking through that just before we went on break. And, and if we look at our gray area of 92 lions harvested at status quo and our 15% harvest projective of 135 lions, that's 46% increase just in the gray area because we're not taking anything from the other area that just seems a little bit shocking to me um when we take a 15 per percent reduction you know nothing changes in our, our red areas our orange areas our yellow areas and or our wilderness so um i agree with casey on this we're we're going to hammer that gray area pretty hard and get a much more much greater reduction than 15 percent but just a little eye-opening to me. Yes, Wally, I agree with you. And when we looked at the 30%, it was much closer to like a 93%, 94% reduction or double what you're talking. And I think that's why we steered away from 30%. Uh, now we're talking, it's, it's 15% too much. I don't know. Hey, you guys are applying percentages to harvest instead of population. When you say 46% jump, that's harvest. That, that's not population. So I'd like FWP to come in and clarify those numbers, please. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't hear anybody else jump in. So you're right. It, it's uh, an increase in harvest. So that that increase in harvest also accounts for reproduction, those type of things that are gonna go on. So you have to harvest a little bit higher, higher increase in harvest um, to realize a, a smaller change in population. Does that make sense? Um, but we would have to go back and recalculate what that we might would look like on the ground in terms of what the actual uh, decline in the gray area might be. But it would be more than 50. Yeah. 
So, Neil, ultimately over the five years, though, at the end of it, with what you'd harvest for lions, if you choose the negative 15%, in five years, you'd have 15% reduction in population then, right? Yeah, that, that's, yeah. If you apply that prescription, it is to come up with a, a goal of after those five years, six years, when we come back and do the estimate, we, if it works, we would be 15% lower. It wouldn't be an annual 15% reduction every year. Yeah, and it wouldn't be the, the number of cats that we're taking that because Casey's saying that it would be more than 15% of the lions. So you'd actually, in, in the end of it though, you'd only have the 15% reduction population, correct? But, yeah, I think the, the difference is if you're talking, if you're talking about the eco region here now, right? So that's everything. And I think to Casey's point is that there are some areas where the wilderness areas and that region two yep. stuff that we were messing with, you're still focusing more harvest on the gray area and the Thompson Falls, if you go with the alternate B, that you might actually see a, a, a greater reduction than 15% in the, that area because you have to, you're offset by those areas where we are not affecting harvest at all. Yeah. So in essence, we could have a 25% reduction in those gray areas, gray areas potentially overall. Yeah, and I have, before we get, I don't know what that actual percentage is, but it would be a greater That's than possible. 15 for sure. Yeah. It's possible. All right. And just to clarify, yesterday we already decided that we're only talking about alternative B. Well, that's, yeah, I guess to me that, that was my point, right? So it depends on where you go. So I think you need to make a decision on what you want to do with the eco region um, in terms of your population increase or decrease, recognizing that it's not evenly spread across the landscape. And then if you do choose something like option, um, the 15% reduction, there's really no difference between A and B. No. Um, we're talking about four lions across the entire ecoregion. So. Uh, Neil, right, I think but we're not talking A, and that keeps coming up from you, Neil. Uh, we've already got rid of A yesterday. It, I'm, I'm okay to go back and revisit A. He, he makes perfect sense that there's no difference. So why, why make it more complicated? I, I, I think we can, we can go back and look at alternative, alternative A. So I'm not for going back to alternative A because I want FWP to have the ability to be able to manage struggling ungulate populations. So for the future, I would like this to be an option for FWP to look at struggling sheep, struggling elk and deer and mule deer populations to where they can facilitate something like this. I think this is a huge opportunity for our ungulates and our sportsmen to have a little bit of a reprieve in predator numbers where they're, they're needing it most. So I'm not for going back to option A, but I, I don't wanna put more pressure where it's not needed either. So I'm kind of hearing a, a, a few different um, strains of conversation here, and maybe the place to start is to think about first selecting that eco region percentage and then narrowing in from there. And we've been kind of circling around the 15% initially, but now I'm hearing some voices that are maybe saying that's too high because it'll actually be higher in certain areas. So um, I brought this up earlier, and I'm just putting it out there again as an option that um, it doesn't have to be zero or 15. If, if this group would like to recommend something between those two, that's okay. Um, or it could be between 15 and 30 also, you know, it's, it's up to you guys, but I just, I'm gonna urge us to maybe first start with the eco region percentage, and then we can get into the conversations about focal areas and, uh, and kind of narrow in from there. All right, Terry, go ahead. Uh, Terry, you're muted. Sorry, go ahead. You can give it another shot. I just want to reiterate one more time that it's the Greer area that's going to take the brunt of all this. Everything else is pretty much staying the same. Now, I know we're doing the whole ecosystem, but it's the Greer area that will take the blunt. 
And uh, to me, it, I'd feel way more comfortable if we lowered that a little bit and, and actually shot for the 15%, not 20, and it is 26% in those areas, 26% difference. That's a lot, that's a quarter percent more mountain lions. That's a lot. So I'm just throwing it out there. That's, that's a quarter of the mountain lions I mean. So. Sorry, thanks Terry. Yeah, Casey, go ahead. Uh, just some my sentiments. I, you know, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, we all want strong deer and elk populations. And that is, I mean, that's the, I think that's a priority for all of us. We might have different reasons why I want strong deer and elk populations because they're going to support good lion populations. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I think it's important that we recognize that maybe some small incremental thoughtful um changes we're all still talking about decreasing lion populations so that that's we're all we all have come to agreement in that but rather than some drastic changes that require like future pendulum swing type activity to counteract what we have done small thoughtful incremental changes i believe can um still get us long term where we need to go and 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 with that you have to understand too, this monitoring process coming back through here in six years will really, will really reveal exactly what that's accomplished. And, uh, and then, then other, you know, thoughtful incremental approaches can be taken um, at that point. But um, large scale drastic changes, in my opinion, you know, typically have a, have an equal and opposite reaction. And um, that's kind of why I, I don't want to see anything large, large scale. Is there any way to possibly boost the numbers down in that Missoula management area or maybe even in the, the focal area to where it doesn't put so much pressure up around? It, it, it sounds like really the issue is is up in Casey's area and um, Terry's area. They don't want to see that huge pressure, but we're okay with some of the, the rest of the eco region. So is there any reason we couldn't raise the like the Missoula special management area number of cats, since that's an urban area anyways, that you are trying to, it doesn't make sense to me to raise the gray area when that's an urban area that you're in concern of people to begin with. So I'd like one of the biologists to comment on that. Yeah, Cody, so the issue in the Missoula special management area is we're not sure by increasing the quota that we'd actually get more harvest. So. Yeah. We're already not meeting that quota. Um, so that's that's the issue there. And then with the, the other lower Clark Fork districts, we've already had a pretty focused effort and high harvest in that area for a number of years. And that's the reason we've taken the approach of you know proposing to back off on that, you know, somewhat at this point. It's still keeping a, a high harvest and some pressure, but just kind of stepping back because of what we've already been been doing in there so um that's anyway that's the rationale with that it liz if you were trying to hit the 15 percent, which most all of us kind of agreed on and voted on how could you do that in this platform without putting most of the pressure up around uh the north end of the eco region I guess if you're you're trying to have the like that focal area in the red zone already, could we just increase the harvest in that area a little bit more to where it doesn't put it doesn't make sense to me to put more cats up in the north side higher than the actual focal area in the red zone. Does that make sense? Yeah, and it um, it may be like Alex kind of presented, uh, you know, thinking about or, you know, it can be somewhere between zero and 15 and, and considerations there for where you guys are, you know, can land in a place that you're comfortable with. Um, but as far as the, the region one focal area, um, yeah, I would, I would kick, kick that to Mike as far as, you know, any thoughts about raising that higher in there, but that was designed as a 30% decline. Yeah. Mike, is that something that to 
to not put the pressure on the gray area of North Mike, would that be an opportunity to have the, the focal area take a few more cats to lower that number up north a little bit? I think all these options are, are, you know, on the table for discussion and, and I don't want to guide which way this group goes. Um, there, there does become a, probably a, a upper limit to, to what's achievable in terms of density of harvest in a particular area. And again, it's this trade-off between, um, you know, trying to have a focal ungulate area and manage the different perspectives of our stakeholders that we viewed when we broke those tables out with, you know, lion hunters versus ungulate hunters. So we're, you know, no matter how we allocate this on the landscape, we're going to face that. I think we're going to face that battle. Okay. Jason, do you have a comment? Yeah, <clears throat> I just wondered why we couldn't, if we all sort of like that 15% number, why we couldn't just specify that, hey, it's not going to be in the wilderness area. It's not going to be in the special management area. It's not going to be in part of that region too, and then apply it to the gray area with the emphasis that you could have a focal point if you need it a little harder in one area or the other. I think that number sort of got us to where we're, all going, hold on, that wasn't the correct number, what we all were feeling good about, all of a sudden it is a different number. So I, you know, that's where I would look at the map, go, okay, well, if we're not gonna apply that 15% number to those areas, why are we even stating that? So Jason, let me rephrase to, to make sure that I'm understanding. So um, instead of using the 15% for the eco region, try to calculate what it would take to do 15% in the gray area while maintaining all the colored areas at the numbers that are shown? Well, we could keep it, I think, 15% in the whole eco region, but specify that in this area where it's a wilderness area, it's not going to do any good. In the Missoula Special Man Management Area, it's not going to do any good. In Region 2, we're already cranked it up 15, 20%. So, I, I mean... Because I think we're having a problem with the numbers, how many are actually 15%. And it's because of those areas are being calculated in that harvest model, but it's not an actual, you know, it's, it's not true numbers, the one you look at it. From an eco-regional standpoint, I guess. Any folks from FWP want to comment on, on that and what's possible there? I guess I, I'm still not sure I'm following. So, so if you want a 15% reduction at the eco region level, I think the prescription that we gave you is what you would have to do. Um, to Alex's point, and maybe and maybe thinking about it a different way. So, if if you're saying that you just want to see a 15% reduction in the gray area, um, we could recalculate that, knowing that those other areas aren't going to change very much. I think we could come up with a harvest that would address that because as I think Casey and others brought it up because really when you apply all that pressure um, in that gray area you're, you're going to see a greater reduction than 15 percent in the gray area so I, I guess I'm not sure if I'm following your following you correctly on that yeah I think we were charged with a 15 percent reduction in the region in the eco region but we're not actually seeing that we're only seeing reduction that we can actually affect in the gray area and so when you're talking eco region, but you're not being access, you don't have access to the eco region, you're really talking 30% reduction, 40% reduction in the gray area. And so the region has changed that we are actually, the committee is charged with. Let me try and, and I think, think your about focal that point. a little bit differently. Um, <clears throat> and uh, again, not trying to uh, put words in anybody's mouth, but the way the agency, as I understand it, the way we've calculated the population, um, the population involves the entire eco region. And, and so to obtain a 15% reduction in the population that's spread across the entire eco region, it has to be um, greater in some areas and not as great in, in some others. Um, 
due to uh, some of the management restrictions we have and due to some of the, um, the biological restrictions, just the access and trying to get that. So in order for us to get a 15% reduction, we could not spread that evenly. So what I'm, what I'm hearing kind of the conversation um, is, is if, if we want to, um, to put together a proposal that will reduce, will focus a reduction within the gray area at about 15%, um, ultimately, that's going to be for the eco region. The reduction will be less than fifteen percent, and and that's completely within the uh, the realm of the uh, of the committees. Um, that that fits exactly in the charge the committee was given. And so, um, if if I'm not sure, uh, without running some additional scenarios and and things. Um, if we could uh, provide that before the end of the scheduled meeting. But if I understand what the, what's being discussed amongst some of the members of the committee is trying to prepare a alternative that would largely uh, target a proportional reduction of 15% uh, within the gray proportion of that population um, and still leave the remainder of the um, of the uh, eco region at the harvest rate that it is now, uh, or is being discussed right now, uh, with a focal area, uh, with uh, the Missoula special management area, with the wilderness areas, um, those would all be the same. But you're looking at what would a 15% proportional reduction within the gray area be, and that for the eco region would be. Um, and I don't know what the percentage would be, but it would be less than 15% for the eco region. Timothy, do you, do you have a comment there? Uh, no, I think that I'd already spoken. Sorry, okay. I'll put my hand no, down. No problem. Uh, Benny, you're, you're next then. Yeah, I, I asked this question uh, several times when when I was doing the questions and answers and filling in the, the boxes. Uh, and that was that the area outlined in red was hypothetical and that it could be anywhere in the, uh, in the eco region. And uh, I was always said, I was always told that yes, it was hypothetical. Now it seems like we've drifted towards that being not hypothetical, but the way it is. Could uh, one of the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks people clarify that for me? No, it, it's always been hypothetical. I guess we the reason we put it there is because of our ability to monitor and other upcoming projects, both in bighorn sheep and elk. But the committee here has the ability to, to discuss other options. Um, we just had to have some some area to give you an example of this is what it might look and, and so you recognize the cost the trade-off in terms of harvest, if you suck harvest into a focal area, what that means for the rest of the gray area. Um, but yeah, it's up to the committee. And I think there are some folks uh, within the committee suggested they'd like to leave it there, but that's still up for debate. Okay, well, I'm glad to hear that because that's a large area and that has a great impact on the, the rest of the numbers. And you know, if that was a, a much smaller, more focal area, it would be different. And I think think to what Brian was saying is that, you know, it's within the realm of this committee to say, well, we recognize that we can affect harvest in somewhere area, some of these other areas. Um, we can still have a focal area, regardless of what size that is, at maybe a 30% reduction, but the gray areas that aren't focal areas, if the goal of this committee is to not reduce that population by more than 15%, we can recalculate what those numbers are. Um, recognize that overall it's not a 15% reduction, it'd be something less. But there's there's a lot of opportunities, like we said, there's infinite number of opportunities here for you guys to, to think about. Timothy. Yeah, I, I brought up similar, and maybe I worded it differently, but similar, if we could pull some of those into the 104, 
that would benefit the 104. And I don't think anybody was against pulling into the 104. We were more against pulling into our area. And in some cases, I think pulling them into the 104 would benefit my area and would assist in pulling some of those out of the gray area at the same time. But I was told we're going to talk to 15% and 0% before we talked to LMUs also. So I set back on for a while. Josh. Josh, I feel like there's enough flexibility with the 15 by the time we settle out on the focal areas that we might be able to come to an agreement because by the time the focal areas get settled out, uh, the rest of the gray area may not have that extra pressure that, that some of the committee members aren't happy with. So I guess uh, I, I'm still okay with just starting with the 15 and working through some focal area. Well, I think under that 15% model, the focal area only adjusted by four individuals. So um, I don't think that uh, changes much when you take away that focal area. Yeah, yeah I I'm, I'm, was assuming uh, that there will be more focal areas. I, I have other areas that I'm interested in in the Northwest corner. So I'm, I'm assuming that by the time we're done, there's going to be uh, a few more focal areas that are going to end up pulling some of that harvest out of the gray and we'll change the numbers. Yeah. Well, some of those focal areas are in the gray and you still have to look at it as there's, uh, you know, right now, the way it is, all of the red and gray under that 15% model is a focal area. It's an intensely hit 20 plus 26% increase in harvest. And so, um, yeah, the whole thing is essentially, a, a, you know, if you think about they hit the, uh, in the Bitterroot study, they targeted that with a 30% increase for two years. That places that entire huntable population of lions in Eco Region 1 under a focal area. Okay, yeah, I, I understand that. I guess, uh, I guess I disagree that that's a, that's a big hit, I think. Uh, Anywhere between 15 and 30 is is not a what I would call a significant uh, decrease, but um, no, I get it. I get your opinion. Yeah, I see it more as that 50 um, 50 cat swing between the zero percent and 15 percent. That's all in the gray area. That was our concern: is when we talk in zero or 15 percent or some number in between that maybe we need to look at those LMUs before we start to drop down to 10%, 5%. We need to have the LMU conversation. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, for the sake of time, do we would just wanna take this to a vote? The If we're gonna vote on the 15th, we already came up with it through everything we've done to this point. Do we just wanna take a vote to vote on the 15% or change that number? Um, is that in our realm, possibly? If, if that's how you guys want to proceed, that's totally fine. Um, I'm, I'm hearing a couple different things being um, put forward. So one is sticking with the 15% eco-regional level change. One is adjusting the um, percent eco-regional change to make sure that that gray area is at 15%. And one which Timothy just raised is actually having a conversation first about focal areas before deciding on the percent change because, um, you know, con contrary to my assertion, those things are actually uh, related and, and um, that might need to be discussed first. So um, those are the kind of three things that I'm hearing being put forward as possible paths forward. And uh, yeah, you guys can, can choose any of those. Um, you can vote if you want to vote. It's really up to you. But yeah, Cody, if you'd like to have a vote on that, we can do that. Okay. Is there anybody else that wants to take it to a vote at all? Or do you guys want to discuss some more about it as far as that goes? 
I'll second your motion. Well, let's just be very clear about what we're voting on and then uh, and then we can do it. So yeah, what, what are you proposing for a vote, Cody? I just, I, I figured either A, we could set the number and then we could work once we hit that number, then at that stage, you could discuss the focal planes and that type of stuff and the disbursement of the lion harvest throughout the eco region once you establish that percentage. Is there anyone who'd like to have some more discussion before we um, take a vote on a number? Yeah, I'm just not ready to vote at this point. I think the vote would pigeonhole us into the gray area and we'd be moving numbers out of the gray area, but we'd still be locked in on an overall eco region percentage that would come from the gray area. I believe it would also come from the focal area because that's, I mean, you're only talking about a four cat difference at that point. So it'd be the focal area. And so the red and gray area would be your 15% decline. If you went 15%, but if those are leaning towards 0%, then that'd be a bigger swing. And so I think you're assuming that we'd all be at 15%. So rather than a vote, we could we could do a poll to kind of see where everyone's at and put a couple of options out on the table and kind of get a sense of where what people are uh, supportive of at this time. Terry, go ahead. I would say I'd like to do a poll real quick first. Yep. I kind of agree with Tim okay. on that. And just before that, I see Josh also has a hand. So I want to get that and then we'll. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, uh, based on the discussion from this morning, I think we know how the poll is going to go based on our committee. Uh, structure. OK, so um, let, let's do a poll quickly. Um, what are what are we polling? Someone put forward a uh, a proposal here that we can that we can get a quick assessment of. If fifteen percent is the number, um, otherwise we need to revisit and come up with a different number between zero and fifteen. That sounds good. All right. So uh, if you're if you'd be willing to support a 15 percent eco regional reduction, um, I guess the best way to do this is uh, not everyone has their camera on. But if you can either raise your hand in real time or use the raise your hand feature, if you uh, don't have your camera on, if you're willing to support that, go ahead and do that now. Well, I see five five hands up out of uh, ten of us here on the committee that are um, ready to support that. We're at maybe now at six. So, do we want to do a, a quick poll of um, the other proposal that was made of uh, a fifteen percent reduction in the gray area? knowing that that will be less than 15% in the eco region, just to see. I'll lower the hands and we can do that. Okay, Grover, Wally. Yeah, could you restate that question? Yeah. yeah. I don't think I understood what you were asking. Yep, sorry. Um, I'm gonna lower the hands and then we'll do it again. Okay. So forgive me for the, yeah, it's one of the clunky parts oh. of Zoom here. So. Um, 
So same thing, raise your hand if you would support a 15% uh, reduction in the gray area, knowing that that would be less than a 15% total reduction of lions in the total ecoregion. So I think that was what um, Jason was suggesting, if I am remembering rightly. So raise your hand if you'd like to support that option. Okay, we've got seven, one, two, three, four, five, six. How many times can you vote? <laughs> <laughs> We've got some, definitely got some double votes here, but that's okay, right? You could be, I'd be you know, I'm fine with the, I'm fine with either, you know, I'm fine with either one of them, to tell you the truth. Right. It's, it doesn't, yeah, you don't have to choose one or the other. We're just kind of polling here what folks would support. So that was six supporting 15% total and eight supporting 15% uh, in just the gray, um, knowing that that would be less than 15% reduction in the eco region as a whole. Um, so that's where we're at right now, Cody, you can. I say we differentiate between those two, which way do we want to lean toward? It might be more, uh, communicate better. Yeah. We, so maybe we can do another one where you, you pick one and not both. <laughs> How about, Sorry, uh, Go ahead. I was going to propose maybe, um, asking the alternate question. Is there anyone who can't live with one of those two options? Is either of those a deal breaker nope. for anyone? I, I see Cody's hand raised. No. Nope. No. Nope. Okay. Uh, right. My hand was just raised because I had a question. <laughs> okay. That was all. We'll circle back to your question, Cody. Um, yep. Casey, do you want to comment on on that uh, question that Sarah just asked, Casey? Yeah, I I just wouldn't be comfortable with a. Uh, um, with the, the prescription of 50% across the eco region as it's described in right now. Gotcha, thanks. And Terry? Um, not sure if I'm on mute or not. We can hear you. Okay, um, yeah, I'm not comfortable with 15% with either. I think it's, I think it's um, yeah, I like to see it be less. And Josh? I'm not comfortable with anything less than 15 eco region wide. Okay, well, good. Well, now we know that definitively we can't make everyone happy. That's good. <laughs> That's somewhere. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not comfortable 15 anymore. I was earlier until I find out the gray area is up to 26. So I think, you know, for me, we need to, go up 15 in the gray and then figure out what, what that's that, what percentage decrease that would be. Yeah, quick I question. Sorry, go ahead. Quick question. The question I had earlier was if you did 15% in the gray, once the red zone of the focal area, which is my area changes um, from red, that would also be considered gray as well for the future. Yeah, if that wasn't a focal area, I think that's a huntable, you know, changeable population. So they're looking at it in a similar fashion. They look at the gray. But I think also, too, you know, using that B, you're, you're still going to have those, that 45 as a focal area, even if we <clears throat> decrease the overall um, in the rest of the gray area. <clears throat> So um, I guess I'll ask a follow-up question for the folks who um, can't live with this idea of a 15% decline. Is there some way to tweak this so that you could live with it? So if we're trying to get to a place where everyone can at least live with a recommendation, how could we find that compromise space maybe? Unfortunately, I think it's a vote. We're not all going to get our what we want every time, but I think that's why we have the committee. We have to go with the popular vote. 
I think we, we may, we may get there if we get stuck, but um, I think Sarah asks a really good question, which is, you know, to give, give those a chance for, for whom this vote might be a deal breaker, give them a chance to, to offer some alternatives about what would, what would soften that or make it not a deal breaker. And, and Josh, I don't, I, I don't want to put you on the spot if you need some more time to think about it, but um, it, it, as the one deal breaker for that option, it might be easiest for us to start with you and, and hear what um, what about that proposal is uh, untenable for you and if there's anything we could change that would make it work for you. I think you're picking on me, Alex. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I can take some time if you want. <laughs> no, 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 I'm good. I, I know my answer. I, I think the only way that, um, you know, I'd be, comfortable going below that 15 is if, uh, is if I've got a focal area for the northwest corner like I originally proposed earlier so uh, so that I can have a, a bigger impact on those, those districts 100 through 104. Uh, our north, uh, those of us up in the northwest corner kind of feel like we're like forgotten about up here. We're like the, the wasteland of, of predator land up here and nobody cares about the deer and elk. And, uh, so uh, yeah, so that's that's the the way I could uh, come back to the group uh, is with the focal focal area in those hunting districts. Josh, sorry to pick on you. Appreciate it. Um, Timothy, go ahead. Yeah, I'd just like to add in that uh, fifteen percent across the region, and I understand other people said earlier that one hundred four and one twenty one mountain lion populations. Are different populations, but when we're talking about eco region population, there's going to be vacuums, there's going to be lines moving to fill those vacuums where food's available. And I've studied wildlife management, and to say that two regions next to each other's populations are completely separate is a fallacy. So, 15% uh, across the eco region is going to create vacuums where other lines are going to move into, but we're talking eco region. And I think 15% is the right number to be talking. So you can say that the gray area, whatever that gray area is, is going to be affected differently. But when it borders the red area, it's not going to, it's going to be affected by the red area as well. So we talk, we're talking eco region. We're talking about a population. We didn't break down the individual uh, district, hunting districts into a specific number. I mean, maybe we did with 121, but we're talking about affecting an eco region. So we need to, I think keep going down that road of eco region, and that's what our charge was, and it should be fifteen percent. Thanks, Timothy. Cody. Yeah, I know our focus is on mountain lions, and I absolutely love running my hounds. That's one of my favorite pastimes. And my opinion on this might be a little bit different. Uh, I was on the phone a couple nights ago with another houndsman, and he made the comment to me. He goes, "You can't have a healthy." mountain lion, lion population without strong ungulates. And so I know if we hit the mountain lions hard for four or five years, it might be an effect right off the bat, but it's going to create more ungulates, hopefully, which will create more mountain lions in return. And so my whole thing, I, I can't, I can't say I, I want there to be more elk and deer, not only for my outfitting business, but also for sportsmen to be able to feed their family. So my vote stays with 15% just because I feel like our ungulates need that, that, that boost. And I think with doing that, we'll have more mountain lions in the future. And everybody agrees on this Mount, mountain lions can't be the only predator targeted. So we need to send to the commission that whatever vote we come up with is that wolves and bears need to be on the chopping block too, to give our ungulates a little bit of, uh, a break and and i know we have more opportunities for wolf hunting the region one kind of got hit a little hard with some of they don't get to do as much stuff as region two does but there is more opportunities out there for wolf hunting i know spring bear hunting kind of got shot down at the last meet, mission meeting but i i have to vote with giving our ungulates a little bit of a reprieve to hopefully have more mountain lions in the future so Thanks for that, Cody. Um, Terry or Casey, as two of the folks who, uh, or Grover, two of the folks who were 
had 15% as a deal breaker. Is there anything in that that could, uh, like Sarah asked, that could make that proposal work for you? Remember your hands up, go ahead. Well, I was just going to, I wanted to address what Timothy was saying. You know, you uh, you, you create a, a vacuum like in the red zone when you, you first you got to understand that cats are territorial. And when you shoot a bunch of them out of the red zone, where they're going to, the transient cats out of the gray zone are going to go into the red zone because they're, that's where the territory is. And so you're actually even dropping the gray zone even farther, you know? So, I mean, you need to consider that too. No, I absolutely agree with you on that. I, I might miscommunicate. That was part of my point. Thank you. Thanks, Grover. Terry. Um, well, I, you know, I mean, I, I agree with what Josh is saying, and, and I, I hear him when you're just talking strict ungulate hunter stuff like that. I like all the predators to be dead, and I'm an ungulate hunter up myself, big time. But the problem is, is that if you pick on, I just think that you know that we're picking on the lions exclusively here when this thing is so much bigger than just lions. And for me, I'd be happy if we went like a ten percent instead of fifteen. I could live with that. Thanks, Terry. Yeah, Casey, go ahead. Yeah, I'm I'm with Terry there and, and all that and, and 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 exactly that. We're still talking decrease. I think that's important to recognize. Nobody's talking about an increase and in, um, our current prescription has been a decrease. Our reliant populations have been going down with the current prescription. Um, you'll notice that even to maintain a stable population, we would actually have to decrease to maintain a stable population from today, we would have to we have to increase or uh, decrease harvest going forward. That was the prescription underneath that's um, in that cheat sheet. So, you know, to, none of us are asking for an increase. We're all saying that we'd be willing to accept a decrease. Um, we're just not willing to accept that, that harsh of a treatment um, across the whole huntable landscape um, in region one. So I, I'm kind of with Terry. I, I, I'd accept maybe a 10% harvest there. Thanks, Casey. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, FWP folks probably can tell us, but I don't think we would be able to get the, the kind of absolute numbers today, probably between 10 and 15, um, or if we have any sense of what that would look like. Yeah, we can try. I get, I've been doing some work with my black screen here and it's good it would take about two hours to run the simulation and mike is actually trying to pull together some numbers for what if we increase harvest density sort of halfway between the ungulate focal area and where it is now throughout that gray region so we're trying to get the numbers ready so that we can run it and then once you guys settle on something it'll take us a couple of hours to run the simulation so it, it depends on when you settle on something Thanks, Justin. Josh? Um, didn't Neil or someone already kind of bring that up, that the difference between 10 and 15 by the time you spread it across the entire ecoregion was, was pretty pretty small, the change? Didn't someone say that? I, I don't think I said that. I think um, the, the big difference here is where you want to take your 15% from, I think is the big question. Do you Absolutely. want to take it from the eco region, or do you just want to take it from the uh, the the area where we can actually manage or, or change harvest? And I think that's that's the big question. Um, you know what we could do. You know, I think Timothy had mentioned maybe including 104 under that 15 cat scenario into that option B, the focal area. The reality is, if you if if the overall goal is a reduction of 15 percent including 104 into that target area would probably add in one or two more lions. And that's about it in terms of the harvest. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. It's, it's going to be a very, very small change by just adding 104 in. So I think uh, if, if, you, if you guys are interested in, in trying to run those numbers, like Justin said, but um, we'd have to kind of step back and regroup a little bit. Right. I think the difference between 30% and 15% in the 121 was a about nine cat swing. 
And so if we move those nine cats, because it's just not possible to pull 54 out of 121, if we move that to the 104, that would benefit 121, but it would be more than the one or two you're talking about. Yeah, I think uh, I think we're talking different things here. It depends on where you're settled, whether you're stable or or 15% reduction, equal region wide. Equal region wide, it doesn't, we have four cats to play with is basically what it amounts to. If you're at the minus 15 reduction. If you're stable, yeah, there's a lot more cats to play with to move around. So I, I could be wrong about this, but do we think there's a way forward with a 10% eco-regional reduction um, and then looking at the map and figuring out some potential additional focal areas that might help alleviate the concerns of those who were worried about 10% being too little? Is that, uh, is that something folks would be interested in doing? That's just me trying to kind of pick up what I'm hearing here. Yes, I think I'd asked for that about 30 minutes ago. <laughs> You're probably right, Timothy. Yeah, I'm usually a step behind on these things. Um, Cody, go ahead. All right, you're muted. There we go. I forgot my question now. Um, I totally lost my question. Sorry. No worries. I'll get in here in a second. Yeah, comes back. I could live with 10%. I remembered it now. Hey, quick question for you. So I know we don't, we're not supposed to talk about season structure, which I think is ridiculous because that depicts on how many lions actually get harvested right now. Region one's in a special permit, special draw type situation. So you're not going to harvest all those lions to begin with. If they change it to an over the counter hybrid not the old hybrid, but to where they have 10 to 30% of the tags still go to special permit, we do got to realize not all of those tags are going to be harvested under the special draw scenario, where I think more tags would be harvested under a general quota. Does that make sense? But no matter what, I don't think we're looking at a general quota in region one or across the state. I think it's more, it, it looked like it was leaning more towards either A, hybrid season or B um, more, I, I think more of a chance of B where it's a general draw and 30% of the tags or something like that go to special permits still. So some of those cats aren't going to get harvested depending on who draws those tags. Right now, all I'm going to say is right now, the commission has some different, uh, has a different option out there that they're asking for comments on. And the commission is going to be the ultimate decision maker on that. And that's why we didn't want to go down this path because mm -hmm. it would, you, that's all we'd be talking about this whole time. We would never get to line, line numbers. So yeah. I think under any, any of the line scenarios that we have on the books now, including the option that uh, the commission is talking about, we could manage lions under any one of those scenarios. Okay. So Cody, to your point, you're saying, I mean, even if we recommend a 15%, the only way we're going to get the full 15% is if we have a really successful harvest, right? Well, I think that's more of an, even if they kept it as special draw, I think that there's a chance that, I mean, Neil could raise and lower it to hit that number, but it, it is a guess. It depends on who draws the tags and the weather conditions and stuff like that. But, Jason, go ahead. Yeah, like uh, Josh down in that where you see it's 35.7 in the lower Clark Fork, there actually can be 50 lions taken. The quality is for 50, but that's just the average harvest in the last five or six years. Um, I'm, I'm just going to add that there, there was not a quota of 50 in there. That was the number of licenses issued. And again, we're not on a quota system right now. So I think that's where I think we have to get away from the structure discussion because um, the licenses we have on the ground now are similar to a, a elk license or a moose license. We don't expect a hundred percent fill. So that's where we're trying to deflect you guys away from this because there's a lot of confusion even over structure and, and what that is. But like I told, uh, said before, under any one of these scenarios, we can manage lions. What we need from you guys is where do we want to be in pop terms of population? And the commission is going to decide what kind of structure we have. 
the thing is, Neo is down there in that uh, orange. Yeah, yeah. It yeah, is a quota. Of it's, two it's, is, it's different than region one. Or oh, you're talking about region two. Yeah, down on the oh, lower sorry. part fork, the orange. Yep. Nope. My apologies. Nope. I thought you're talking about uh, the Thompson focal area. Sorry. So yeah, that's Jason, where I think Cody's point where, hey, if it is a different type of season structure, you <laughs> might not get 15%. You might only get, you know, you might get less than zero. Just depends on the conditions. If the cats are there and it's a quota, though, you'll get them. You know, the only time when you don't get those quotas reached is is when the cats just aren't there anymore. And uh, I don't know what your what what's the harvest at right now in that area. Uh, I think it's uh, close to probably thirty, maybe. <clears throat> and has there been a lot of hunting? But it pressure? goes. It doesn't start until February first, so it's an open quota right now to where you could come down and you can fill that quota if you had the conditions. But you're what into saying, March first now. What and I'm it saying. It started is, February first, so it's out. It's raining right now. Well, I'm saying though it, that there was also tag holders affecting that quota through the whole months of December and January. Yeah, the permit guys that drew a permit can hunt in December, January. After February first, it's wide open. Anybody right. with a Region Two tag can can come and go so what i'm saying is that if the cats were there there's been a lot of days of hunting pressure in the month of february if there was more lions there they would have met that quota already correct nah it's conditions and guys don't want to you know i mean i got every tool available so i can go up the road on tracks snowmobiles whatever it is i don't have to stay on the main road but if you got to stay on the main road yeah your hunting's done I have seen two tag holders in that unit between the month of December and January for 200 and 202 the entire December and January. And we ran a lot of days in that unit. So sometimes the tag holders just aren't getting out there. Now we don't try to run on the weekends. So to give the locals tag holders opportunity, but Monday through Friday, there we've seen two people in December and January. So that's where I'm just going. That if the season structure is going to depict how many how many get harvested. If you're under a season structure like me, you got to jack it up so far to get the harvest number you want. So it just depends on the season structure how that goes. I think. I think. To Neil's point is that, you know, you can get lions dead however you want to, you know, with any of those season structures. There is there is benefits and negatives to all of those season structures, but it, it just what what changes is the is who ends up punching those tags. That that's the big the big change. And then at what time of year those tags get punched. So um, but I think FAP can can use whatever methods given them by the commission to affect the changes that we as a commission prescribe. So I think we were just about on the verge of uh, taking a look at a map and thinking about if there was a way to, to um, draw some lines on that map so that a 10% reduction would satisfy everyone. Do folks feel like that's a good next step? Should we try to take a look at that before lunch in the next 45 minutes or so? Grover, I don't know if you're trying to speak, but you're on mute. Yeah, I'd like to see that 10% run and see what the difference it makes in that gray area. Because uh, it seems like the gray area right now is is where everybody's kind of stuck on. I was, I was set on 15% until I see that now the gray area is 26%, you know, now I would rather s drop it down to 10% and see if it gets and keep the red and, uh, and the yellow and everything the same and see, and see what, where it's at. So Justin and co, it seems like we've got a, 
at least we have enough information to know we want to see that 10% if that can be something we can pull up in the next couple hours. And in the meantime, we can start looking at the map and thinking about um, how to arrange focal areas such that that 10% might be palatable. That sounds good. Do you, do you mean um, you'd like to know what kind of, what the harvest would look like in the gray area at an eco-regional decline of 10%? Or do you want us to work the other way? Like if we want a smaller decline in the gray area, what would the overall change be at the eco-regional? I, I guess I'm a little confused on which, which one. Do you understand my question, Alex? I, I do. So, and, and I'll, I'll say what I think we want and then someone else can correct me when I go wrong. So I think we wanted to see, uh, you know, the numbers for a 10% decrease at the eco-regional level so that we have those numbers to look at and then think about how we might um, then reorient some focal areas um, within the eco-region to try to, to make sure everyone's uh, as satisfied as possible. But if someone else would like to uh, weigh in on a different understanding or correct me if I'm wrong here, that's fine too. Yeah, just mathematically looking at it, the, the numbers are, it drops 19. So if it's dropping 19, that's like one per district. Sorry, Timothy, I'm, I'm not sure I follow. What drops 19? 19 cats in the gray area. When you look at the numbers, if you look at 15%, mm -hmm. then you're at 131.2 in the gray area. So that number drops 19 cats when you drop down to 10%. And that's spread out through the entire gray area. That's like one cat per district. So that's what we're talking about moving. Where are you getting the 10%? Number from I think Timothy. Is, I think Timothy Justin's working it through a whole different modeling um, to to come up with those numbers. It's not just simple math in in that area. Okay. Yeah. We'll let them draw. Okay. But is that is that is what the way Alex conveyed it? What you'd want to see from us? Yeah. Okay. Alex, I guess maybe I'll ask you, would you be willing to send me, um, Mike, Liz, Neil, like the FWP folks into a breakout room so I can just clarify with them what kind of math we actually need to do here? I think there might be a faster way. That's what Mike and I were talking about. You're on mute, Alex. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's no problem. Give me uh, one second here. I think I just okay. opened it for you. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. So in the meantime, um, sorry, Josh, you've got a hand up, go ahead. Justin, are you still there? I think he's gone to the breakout room. Sorry, <laughs> I can send you in there real quick if you want. Yeah, I just had a question. I wanted to see if he could quickly and easily um, show me some numbers for that focal area that I've been advocating for. So yeah, can you send me in there with it? Yep, no problem. Thank you. So folks, in the meantime, um, I'm going to suggest that maybe I'll, I'll share my screen with the map and we can start thinking about other focal areas. Let folks think about that, talk about that, how those might help uh, satisfy those who are um, concerned about 10% not being enough. Does that sound good? All right, I'm going to go for it. Can everyone see that? Great.
It might be helpful. I mean, I, I know you guys know this landscape really well. It might be helpful for Sarah and I in terms of taking notes to get the slide from Mike, I guess, that has the um, the units just, numbered. What do you think, Sarah? Would that be useful? What if we did this? What if we just asked the biologists which other region one areas, ungulate population, sheep, moose, goat, deer, like all that type of stuff, which ones are in the red zone? And then we just put a focal area in every area in region one where our ungulate population is in the red zone. And then the areas that Casey and Grover and Terry are concerned about that are in their regions, if they're not in the red zone, then we don't have to worry about it, right? So our whole goal is to try to help boost ungulate populations and have a stable mountain lion population at the same time. So why not just do it in areas where the ungulate populations in the red zone and make it simple for the biologists? I think we're focusing on just two of our nine objectives if we do that. What's is as far as well, I mean, that's what our, our resource needs, right? So I would assume your area that you're vetting for right now, 104, is in the red zone for ungulate levels. I don't right? know if the studies were done in that area, but I know that the other issue was the human in uh, human conflict, human impact or whatever. Yeah. That word there, but. I just think that would make the most sense because then you're, you're helping ungulate populations where they need it most and areas where they don't need it where maybe Casey or Terry are talking about, then therefore you wouldn't have to worry about it in your area if, if your elk and deer and moose are doing well. Go ahead, Benny. I agree. Uh, and that's what I had mentioned early on when we started going, going down this road. Um, <laughs> You know, I think that we ought to take it up with our biologists and and get their opinions on our pet areas. And I've mentioned my pet area. Um, we're probably all going to have our pet area, and mine's not very large. Um, and yeah, I think I think we uh, need to take it up with our biologists for our given areas and see how valid our concerns are. Benny, what area is your area? What district? Uh, along the uh, Galton Range and Whitefish Range, Front Range, and I guess you probably can't see where my arrow is pointing, but um, no. um, uh, to the just a little to the west of that green area that's on the the northeast corner of our eco region, um, more or less, it'd be uh, uh, the more or less the east side of 109 and and the unit down below that down towards whitefish see i think if, if you did this anywhere uh, ungulate population is struggling it'll give the opportunity for the biologists to also our big concern is is for them to add bears and wolves to it right so now this is an opportunity for fwp to open up uh, open up all of these areas where the ungulates are hurting to also bear and wolves, I think, for the future. So it's untying their hands to help all the predators, which is probably Casey and I's biggest concern is if we hit the mountain lions, we need to hit the bears and the wolves as well. So Sure, because there's a lot of bears and wolves up where I'm talking about also. Yeah, but but that's I mean that's the only way to fix this problem is habitat loss and not take the gas pedal off of bears, wolves, and lions to increase ungulate populations. So if, if you did it this way, I think it structures it in a way that now it sets a precedence for any area that it's the red zone is a predator management area, theoretically. So that, and the that's area that I'm concerned with is not a big area and it's and it's it doesn't have great access because it's bordering uh, private land and yeah. it's at the private uh, public interface. There's state land, a lot of state land and then national forest. Um, and so 
it would need to be targeted and, and have lion hunters motivated to hunt there. Um, because I think there's cats in that strip that aren't getting hunted um, much at all, just because of accessibility and motivation. But the mule deer along there are struggling. And then there's a small herd of big horn sheep up there in 109 that probably get hit too, as they do down on the um, southern end of the cabinets. So folks, should I grab at least someone from FWP to pull them back in here so they can give us some, uh, some insight on where the uh, struggling ungulate populations are? Would that help? Yeah, if that would be an opportunity. Let me um, pop over to that room. You guys keep chatting and um, I'll grab somebody and be right back. So just for discussion, not for decision or anything, but uh, area 100, the Northwest corner has a high population, but that is a very low populated human presence there. My great, great grandfather homesteaded there in 1909. Um, people that move there, I think are moving to an area where they know there's grizzly bear and mountain lions at. And I don't think there's a human conflict issue in that area because the people that are moving there know they're moving into that area. So I just see that's really dark. And I don't think that that's necessarily means that we need to focus on hunting that area by any means. I don't know if anyone else in that Northwest corner had any thoughts on that. I didn't, uh, I wasn't concerned about that area. I think that's what Josh was just referring to though. He's saying that, that he, he needs that 100 hammered down because nobody cares about his deer and elk up there. So I think let's whale on a 100 if that's what he wants, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was saying. And it does border, it borders Libby. So the human conflict of actually, you know, downtown Libby, that is 100. No, I hear, yeah, I, hear right what you're I hear what you're saying, Josh, and I agree partially with what you're saying. This, this is an old hound argument from the old days, so don't take this personal, but we used to argue with all the hound guys, being a hound guy, because 100's half in Eureka and half in Libby. And we used to fight with them. We used to say that that, that needs to be split like they do moose. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I've been on the phone with a couple of different hound guys when we've been talking and, uh, you know, they're, they can live with a 10, 15% Quote, but beyond that, they said it could get scary. And uh, because it, we've seen it trip before when we've, when we've had no, you know, after, after 95, we had the big winter. I'm, we're just talking. So after 95, when we had the big winter, we slaughtered lions because lions were looking for food and they were moving a lot. And we slaughtered them for a few years. So we just really knocked them down. We had huge quotas. And you can look, go back and reflect that. But after that, for a couple of years, it was very hard to find a lion. And we got to be, you know. And Terry, I think it's important to recognize that. What was the counteraction to that, to that action? We, they ended uh, up, they ended up pendulum swinging it the other way, dropped the quotas down to nothing, let lions get to the highest level that I had ever seen them even after that. And so then you do this other pendulum swing, we wail on them again. And then we, then we pendulum swing and we don't kill any. And that's just no way to manage small incremental changes. This is the right direction. This is the direction you guys want, but we don't need to be drastic. You know, it, we will get there. And then you're not facing the opposition of that pendulum swing here in six years when we go through and do a monitoring and go, holy smokes, this isn't where we thought we should be. Now they reduce tags by 20% across the whole region. Is that what you want? You know, small incremental changes in the direction you want to go will get you there in the long run. And, and that's, that's my thought. I think you're right. We have to manage these things. I said that from the day one. We have to manage these things for the long haul. That's always been my thing. The long haul, not the short haul. It never works. It always ends up <clears throat> somebody's unhappy and, and, and not actually not good for the lions or the ungulates. So. so I think Neil is here and I have some comments about the, uh, the geography for us. Neil, go ahead. Yeah, I just, I just like to hear from the group. So what, were, what, were this, what was the question again? So the question, Neil, was instead of making the focal area like Sanders County, in order to, to harvest these lions where it matters most, why couldn't we just make this to where any area where our ungulate populations are in the red zone, 
those are focal areas going forward. And I mean, hopefully in the future, we could add wolves and bears to that focal area. But if you made that, I would that be more tangible if you're focusing in areas where our ungulate populations were in the red? You know, I, I think the, the challenge here is going to be, um, you know, all across the eco region, depending on where you're at, I mean, our recruitment rates are not as high as they are in some other areas. Now, there's a whole bunch of variables, including that, and predation is one of them. Um, so it kind of comes down to which species you're talking about, right? So if you're talking primarily about mountain, having the best, biggest bang for your buck for mule deer, um, some of our best mule deer areas are going to be the 100, 103, 101, um, and then the the whitefish range, which I think uh, Terry and others have said, you know, this can, might be a little bit tough to actually increase harvest greatly there. That's where we have some of our best line hunting or mule deer hunting. Um, it's not the only place. Um, the Thompson Falls area is another place where mule deer numbers um, probably aren't as good as they could be. Um, if you're talking about elk, you know, the Thompson Falls area is our best elk area. Um, but then you have 103, which we have uh, the Lost Trail, which is our probably number two. Um, so the problem is, you know, if you're trying to pinpoint LMUs that are the best to focus this on, it it's, it's, gets to be pretty difficult. Um, the reason we picked the Thompson Falls area is because there's three, uh, three species that would benefit there. One, it's our number one bighorn sheep area, and we've seen bighorn sheep numbers decline. We actually have future efforts going on. Um, they're not realized yet but we're trying to look at predation and impacts on bighorn sheep populations and those were picked as some priority areas um, we also have the nox and study that we talked about um, and we do have uh, 122 is actually a pretty good mule deer area as well 122 121 um, so the, you know the areas that are primarily whitetail to be honest with you are like 101 is our biggest some of our biggest whitetail areas 130 the swan um, you're not going to have as much bang for your buck there in terms of benefiting mule deer. Um, 100, though, is a good mule deer area. So that's one of the problems you're going to be facing is that you end up with this kind of hodgepodge of, well, this LMEU over here, uh, maybe a 101 over in this area. And then you start to lose some of your effectiveness because I think folks have talked about, you know, immigration and emigration and movement of lions and um, you're probably better off to have it in a little bit of a block. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's definitely not straightforward. Uh, you know, the places that we'd really like to see the biggest harvest to see what happens would be in the, in the wilderness area, but we just can't get it done. Um, there's no way to do it. Any questions on that? Go ahead. Uh, yes, thought, Neil. Uh, just for my understanding, with our charge, we're charged with LMU emphasis. Does that mean that we need to be deciding whether or not we should have an LMU emphasis or that we should be deciding as a committee where that emphasis should be? Or should we be leaving that up to you just saying that we need one? You know, I, I, think, I think you can go either way. I think one of the problems you've, you've seen right now is everybody's got their own kind of pet area that they want to have an emphasis on. And that's one of the reasons why we said the overarching goal here is to focus on, on the eco region. Um, because once you start, you know, getting down into those LMU areas, then you start, you know, my backyard kind of thing comes up quite a bit. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's up to the group. Um, you know, from a biologist standpoint, where I want to be able to do things, if, if our charge here is to reduce lion populations, and overall predator numbers, I want to be able to monitor the effectiveness of that because you can, we can all sit here and say, well, we're going to reduce line numbers by 15% across the board or 30% in a focal area. And then we don't realize maybe any change in the ungulates. Um, and we need to be able to try to evaluate why that might be happening. Um, one of the problems, you know, that we haven't talked about here um, for like bighorn sheep populations you know, one of the, the struggles we have is getting harvest, lion harvest in some of those areas because sheep are typically in rugged areas. Um, the same thing with mule deer, you know, winter range is a little bit less rugged, but 
they have a tendency to occupy some pretty tough country sometimes and getting folks to effectively go in there and harvest lions can be a challenge. Um, you know, you talked about 104, for instance, a big portion of 104 is wilderness area with no roads. So the only place they really harvest lions is going to be in that lower elevation stuff where they can actually get into it. So there's some practicality on the ground in applying this that has a lot of nuances to it. Um, and you can get in the weeds really quick. Um, so I, I don't know if that helps at all in your decision making, but yeah, depending on, you know, if, if I heard that mule deer were the number one thing that we're worried about, I'd probably put it somewhere else. If I heard that, you know, where we might have the biggest bang for the buck for elk, bighorns and mule deer, I'd probably leave it in the Thompson Falls area. Recognizing that, uh, you know, we have a large wintering population in 103 in that Fisher area that wouldn't be addressed. What do you go ahead? Yeah, Neil, one of the things I had brought up to Mike a long time ago, and it was kind of this idea of focusing on problem ungulate areas was our bighorn sheep in between 121 and 122, they both had giant die-offs. And I have two hunting camps at the head end of the largest sheep population in uh, between Plains and Thompson up in Munson. And those rams used to be out in the big open parks and the dusting areas. And when the wolves moved in up there, all those sheep disappeared from that country and they moved out over the faces and the rocks. And what I've noticed is our lions had been getting jumped off their kills in those areas. And so it doesn't take long to have some problem lions that are just focusing on sheep because now they don't get their kills taken away from them if they kill a sheep in the rocks and those areas. And so I thought, what if, what if you made it, it, this is just for the sheep now, but what if you made a, an area that was just focused on targeting lions for those sheep? And, and I know personally myself, guys like Casey, other people on this group, if you had an area, all the other areas are closed, there's nowhere to go kill a, a lion, but I could go walk my dogs in March and April up into those sheep areas, I would do it with that thought process, oh, I'm going to target a, a, a lion that's that's just targeting on sheep. And so is there any possibility with that, Neil? I think there's some room for discussion there. The problem is, you know, it's it's hard for hard for us just to go in and draw, start drawing out new new hunting districts. But what we could do is if you had an LMU prescription, we could maybe look at prescribing some of that harvest to be focused in a certain area. Um, I will let you know that, you know, over in the Kukanusa, we have a, a struggling sheep herd there. And I think it's more than just predation, but one of the things we try to do is get an increase in lion harvest there and we, and we just couldn't get it done. Um, yeah. They're trying to get folks to go in there and we just didn't see a, a change in harvest. That's that area. It's not necessarily every area. Um, but I think, you know, the, the problem is, is trying to have folks on this committee do that would be a pretty tall order. It's going to have to be very site specific and we'll have to figure out how to go about doing that. We'd have to get permission approval. So it's a process for sure. Um, what I like to rather do is, is if we pick, pick focal areas and we want to have folks focus on it, just try to encourage folks to, to target as best they can. Um, the reality, you know, for something like mule deer, um, that's probably going to be <clears> less <throat> effective because you will have animals moving in and out. For sheep, um, it maybe takes a line or little bit of time to figure out how to hunt sheep effectively, but eventually those areas do fill back in. So it's, it's a mix, you know, um, you probably have to have harvest over a larger area as well as focusing on those smaller areas to have any kind of a actual effect. Um, you know, I would discourage the group from thinking that you can go in and pinpoint an area, increase harvest there and everything's going to be good. Um, I think there, there's enough fluidity in that population that that probably wouldn't help. You're going to have to harvest over a larger area, reduce that number, um, and then still get guys to focus on those lines and like for sheep especially, um, where you might be able to pick up some of those individuals that are really focusing in on sheep. Does that uh, make sense? It, it does. I, I just know of a few cats, big toms, that hardly ever, ever cross roads. And if you give the houndsman an opportunity, he's gonna go run up the bottom of some flat road where there's multiple roads and ever turn loose in that type of country. And so if it was a prescription that was made just for those sheep 
and you literally just drew a line around that sheep district and this is the only area that you could get this lion tag it, it would it would help target that lion that's doing that and so that that was my only thing is i mean there there's a there's one tom in particular that literally like you could just follow him around and pick up sheep heads i think because that's all the cat focuses on and he crosses a road once a year so i i i know that targeting i mean you guys have put up giant fences and done amazing stuff with that thompson falls herd but ultimately if you don't focus on those certain cats it would be hard to see yep. results soon i guess yeah and all, all i can tell you is that's been an ongoing discussion about you know especially for bighorns you know i think it's different for mule deer and elk which are a little bit more general um but for for bighorn sheep that's been a discussion we've had um amongst our group like i said we've got we've got some uh plans in the works anyway to try to address predation on bighorn sheep in a couple of those primary priority areas in in the Thompson Falls area and that exact conversation has been part of the of our discussion about okay well yeah we could lower potentially lower line densities but if we don't actually focus on some of those individuals that specialized in in uh, targeting sheep will we have any impact on what uh, what would this what would this group have to do, Neil, to help get something in front of the, the commission or in front of I the think, right people? I think it's, it, you know, there, there's a lot of discussion here. And I think there's there's room for the committee. And Alex or Sarah can correct me if I'm wrong. But we talked kind of like about, about a parking lot or general recommendations from the group that don't have to necessarily be part of the lion population up, down, um, stay the same discussion. And that would be, you know, instructing or asking the department that if bighorn sheep are a concern, could we develop a scenario where we could target um, at least those areas, lines in those areas to, to improve uh, potential uh, conditions for, uh, for ungulates. Does that make sense? It wouldn't, yeah. be, it wouldn't be part of what you guys decide, but it would be, here are some other things that we want the department to consider and work on because we think they're important. Okay. Thank you, Neil. Does that, everybody else, does that make sense? I can see Casey's got his hand up. Casey's had a hand up for a while. Go ahead, Casey. Oh, no, I just uh, was had a question regarding another bit, but yeah, my input too on that discussion, Neil, is uh, I, I uh, killed a few lions up there in the Urals, you know, tweets on the East Kootenai there, you know, this is probably 15, 20 years ago going on now. We had, they were giving out 10, you know, special tags and, and that worked pretty good, but it's really difficult to make sure those tags get in the hands of somebody that actually is going to be successful harvesting. Cause it definitely was an intimidating place at times. It's just, there's no access. And it's also, you know, a lot of guys don't want to go um, snowshoe for 10 hours. And, and we, we were able to be successful in there. Um, uh, I think you'd about, you know, it's always like, like you, like you said, they're trying to be able to get the right people uh, or, or create the right incentive. Um, I think it would have to happen in a way that was like quota um, driven or any, any, anybody could go in there and hunt. Now um, where you have a lot of things, like if I put in for a special unit, then I can I no longer, drop, you know, pick up an over the counter tag that limits me now from being able to go to some of those target areas. And, and, and really it, it, if you had two or three of the right hunters hitting in that area, you probably could make a pretty good difference, but you know, being able to get those right people, you know, I've seen it in other States and studies and I, I know a houndsman I've sold pups to in California and that's all he's done for 25 years is kill lion killing or kill lions that kill sheep. And he literally waits until they kill one sheep and he, he might find them, watch them, until they kill a sheep, he doesn't kill them. And, uh, you know, but that's one dedicated salaried person that um, it's a whole, that's like not, not Montana's model really. So. Yeah, no, I, um, I think you make a good point. Yeah. You have to, uh, it's, it's a special group of hunters out there, just like, you know, upper elevation mule deer hunters, you know, the wilderness mule deer yeah. hunters, they got to be willing to really almost kill themselves to get in there to do it. Yeah. It's not, it's you, you got to be a little retarded the <laughs> the other thing uh um in regards to the folk area there and thompson falls i mean looking at it 
I like my personal sentiment is I like the aspect of, uh, of seeing that, um, that the data that could be collected off of that, that, that increased line prescription, as well as the mortality type work that's going to be getting done in there would be really valuable, I think, long term for a lot of these decision making type of discussions. And, and so I, I'd hate to miss out on that opportunity if there's already some of that work in place. I think that'd be the right spot to do it. That's and, my and, sentiment. Yep. And admittedly for the Noxon project, it's, it's focused on elk, which I mean, still is probably the number one thing we hear about from, from hunters, mule deer, probably second to that. Um, so the Noxon project, just to give you guys an idea, is, is pretty much an all encompassing elk project. We're looking at both habitat conditions, um, predation conditions, and what's affecting those elk, the elk movement and vital rates. So it's, it's probably the most encompassing study I've seen in my 25-ish plus years of, of working with FWP. If we can pull it off, it's gonna be a lot of challenging, but we're gonna get numbers on all the predators because you know there's been a lot of discussion here about the impact of bears and other things. And, and until we get some data, um, you know, I, I have, my old mentor used to have a saying in, in the face of no data, everybody's theory is valid. And that's including mine as well. Um, but until you get the data, you don't really know what's going on. So um, it's important to get information. And from my standpoint as a, a biologist to try to affect future management. Um, and so all, the reason we did pick the Thompson Falls area is uh, admittedly because of the Noxon study, as well as future discussions about bighorn sheep. But that does not mean this commission, this committee can't recommend doing it other places. I don't want to tie you to that necessarily, but just give you the justification for originally selecting that. And then conversation there, Cody, as to your point about, you know, giving them that ability to kind of affect specific struggling populations. I, I agree with your sentiment. I, I think the problem that would happen is that all of eco region one would be applicable in that discussion. And so if everything's a, a target area, then nothing's a target area. So, um, you know, I mean, when you really look at it, it, you could, there might be microcosms within each unit that are doing well, but, but as a, at a general landscape level, I think you could say they're all struggling. Yeah. And, and to your point too, Casey, with if the season structure does turn that direction, maybe that's something we can suggest to the commission that says if Fish, Wildlife and Parks has any areas of concern, especially like the bighorn sheep areas, those are, anybody could still buy a license. Those are not um, taken off the table so that it creates opportunity for the guys that can get it done. Which is like, I think what they've done with the Missoula special management area, you know, I think anybody's able to get in there because they're really wanting to increase um, yeah. opportunity there. Um, so that, that I'm sure that's possible. So folks, we're starting to get toward lunchtime. And um, I know this has been a really good discussion. I think one thing that Sarah suggested is, is a really important point, which is, and, and this has come up from, from all of you as well, which is that we don't have total precision in how this will all work out. And so one possibility is to suggest a range and to say that 10 to 15% is the recommendation of the committee, and then give all of you a chance to kind of weigh in on where where you stand on that spectrum and, and reflect that and in, in what we share. Um, and that might be more true to, uh, to what's actually possible. I, I don't know, Neil and Brian can speak to that. Um, I know the folks in the other breakout room are still kind of calculating. So we'll get those numbers from them. Uh, Wait, I can do There's you just guys, a update on that is we're going to have, have a new cheat sheet for you after lunch. Super. So we don't need to run another simulation to do it. And the way we're approaching it is a 10% eco region wide decline. What would that look like in the gray area? So all the, the R1 focal area around Thompson Falls, the R2 focal area, Missoula special management area, and the backcountry areas, the green areas will all stay the same. So we'll just mess with that gray area. And then Josh, uh, in terms of adding a new, another focal area centered around Libby, um, that would work the same way or there or anywhere else where we basically would um, calculate the increased harvest we would need there and then 
put it there and subtract that out of what, what is already in the gray area, if that makes sense. So if, if we settle on that one or other ones, I don't know where you ended that conversation. Uh, we, we can handle that within either the 15% or the 10% decline scenario. And I think the is there other any area in that region where licenses are available and nobody's putting in for them or are all the licenses being sold out? Right now, all of our special licenses are, are sold out. Um, again, uh, I, I'll be surprised if we don't see some fairly significant changes to our season structure coming out of the commission this April. So I'd encourage you guys to you get online and comment there. But, you know, I think Casey, I think it was Casey brought up another really point for everybody to remember is that this is an adaptive management process. So whatever prescription you, you prescribe, know that in six years, we're going to go back and evaluate where you are and then have to reevaluate where you want to be. Um, so there is a little bit of uh, cushion, I guess, if you will, or comfort, knowing that what you're, you're not deciding the future of lion harvest from now until the end of time. Um, there's going to be a chance to go back, revisit it, see where we're at, and then come up with a different direction if we need to. And if other LMUs become necessary two years from now, your biologists are going to be able to educatedly make those decisions yeah we actually have a lot of things on the ground now that which is a i mean this is gets to be really complicated but we're actually looking at different methodologies for coming up with population estimates in air, in region one where we can't fly because of the tree cover and those things are all a year or two down the road but eventually we're going to hopefully get it to a better spot where we have better better numbers on on what's on the ground um, and then can make more informed management decisions off of that So did we, uh, as a group, come to any um, decisions or, or highlight any areas of emphasis? Or is that where, is anyone willing to try to summarize where that conversation has landed just before we break for lunch? Maybe the answer is just it's complicated, but... I'm not sure what you're asking. You're asking about where we feel LMUs might need to be or? Yeah, I think we, we, we had the map, Sarah, Sarah put the map on the screen and we were kind of thinking through different possibilities for um, where areas of emphasis or uh, focal areas for hunting or for um, uh, areas of concern for ungulates would be. And I just wanted to kind of step back and see if this group had come to any decisions or had any summary thoughts on that that we could try to articulate before we break for lunch. Maybe we just need to discuss more and that's okay too. Yeah, I think, I mean, just what I previously said, uh, 104 from where I sit, I know Josh over in Libby had some areas. I don't think anyone had written anything down, took any notes specifically on all of them. Is that what you want to do right now? I think the, the, yeah, if we have anything we want to record, we can do that and have that as a reference to return to after lunch. Um, if folks want to put forward anything. Yeah, like I said, 104 for me, but Joshua, I don't know if you're available right now. Yeah, I'm here. It, yeah, I'm, I'm still interested in a focal area around Libby, those, those four hunting districts. And I, I think the plan is to kind of give you some data on yeah, that, what that would look like. Yep. So Josh, that's the 100, 101, 103. Does that include the 104 also? Awesome. It does. Those are the four that I specifically asked Justin to uh, take a look at as a focal area, that, that block. Right. Does anybody else have any others they wanted to add in? I think it's important to note that that's like a third of region one. 
<laughs> as well as there's so much biological diversity in that particular, what you just spoke there. There's everything from 60 inches of rain, rainforest, to 15 inches of rain country. So I, I don't think you can landscape level make that a, no, I don't um, know. a focal area. Well, I understand all of that, Casey, but um, a 10% reduction is not going to effectively meet the majority of the objectives for that area. So I feel like the focal area is the only way I'm going to I'm going to achieve any of those objectives. So uh, that's really why I'm looking at it as a focal area. Oh, I, I see your 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 uh, uh, methodology there. I just I don't I don't think that's an accurate way to to go about that. Is there any other regions that anybody else wanted to add into the discussion? Not a decision at this point, just discussion. So Alex, that's I think what we have right now is 100, 101, 103, 104. Yeah, I've got that recorded so we can return to those after lunch. So I'm gonna suggest we break for lunch. We come back in an hour. And by then, um, we should have the new cheat sheet to look at, and we can kind of dig into that and uh, take another step toward um, toward our final recommendation here. Alex, can I ask for one, one bit of clarification, and then maybe I could have you send me back to the room. So is the ask to look at the Libby area, so that 100, 101, 103, 104, excluding 121, so that would no longer be a focal area or added in as a focal area? Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I don't want to speak for anyone, but my understanding is that that would be an addition rather than a, than a substitution. Okay. I I'm not talking of excluding anything at this point. Um, someone further south around Sanders County might be able to talk to that, but that was just in addition to. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure we're on the same page so we produce the data you want. Can you send me back to the room then? Sure. Or give me that option, Alex? Thank you. I think, I think it's also important to remember about 101 that we're already going to do some, that Ethan, our local biologist, is going to make some recommendations on the mule deer for 101 anyway. I'm not mistaken. So we need to right. talk about that after the break. Recommendation. Okay. I think, I think the, what people here want to do is to see what we're doing on 109. I don't, I don't know where that's at, but I know that's what people want to see. So they're already being protected. I guess is my point. They're going to be, and should be. So, all right, folks. Well, let's let's take a lunch break, and we'll come back with more information in our fingertips. So, thanks again, everybody, and we'll see you at uh, one o'clock.
I'm almost there, folks. Another two minutes. Sorry. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate you. For those within earshot, we're going to get started here in just a minute. Mike is just uh, wrapping up the new cheat sheet for us, so we'll be able to take a look at that in just a moment. We can see you again, Grover. Yeah, I just figured out right. what I did accidentally. I did it again. <laughs> I reversed it. Second time's the charm. <laughs> so hopefully everyone had a good lunch. We're in the home stretch now. And um, you know, I think we're, we're kind of getting into a, a place where I know uh, we've had enough information now for everyone to have formed uh, pretty strong opinions on what they're thinking. So the next step is going to be, um, you know, thinking about those in context, thinking about them in the context of the broad eco region, in the context of some of the uncertainty that we know is present in the estimates and in the ability of uh, FWP to meet really specific targets. So um, I'll just put that out there as something to bear in mind as we start to see these new numbers. And, and you know, we can all ask ourselves whether small differences are really gonna be that meaningful um, as we come to a final conclusion or whether you know, something a little more general will be helpful. Those are things for you guys to think about. Um, and pretty soon when Mike is ready, Mike, will you be able to share your screen and show us the cheat sheet? That might be the easiest. Probably shouldn't distract him while he's finishing up. Um, yeah, over the next few hours, we're gonna try to, to get to a final recommendation uh, to the commission. And that will be our target, but it can also include some of the other important points of emphasis or discussion that you guys have raised. We've been keeping track of those along the way, but we'll make sure that we have them um, recorded um, and captured. 
uh, in the way that you want them before it's all over. So um, that's just a little preview for what's coming up for this afternoon. Um, but yeah, I think we can it'll be best served to wait for the cheat sheet before we dig into any further discussion. Although folks have comments or thoughts that inspiration that came up over lunch, we can, we can dig into that now too. Well, how about them Yankees? <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> There's more people watching than you think. I at lunch hour, I fielded several phone calls. So from kill all, from kill them all to don't kill any. How's that? So it's our uh, our range into perspective a little bit, huh? <laughs> yeah. Is there any points that you can share from those phone calls that we could benefit from? Well, I had a couple of three lion guys call me. Um, then they were, uh, for instance, they, they had no idea what was even going on. Someone told them. And so they got on YouTube and then two of them hadn't actually even been on YouTube. They're listening to the other guy, but they're all, they're concerned. Um, you know, they all said they could tolerate 10% or something. All those guys. And I'm just, they said, but they thought to, to kill 30%. I was trying to explain to them that 30, 15 or 30% is not all one year for, for six years. I'm not sure they heard me very well, unless they've been here for the whole thing. So, but uh, you know, I had a I had a phone call from a guy, and I don't think everybody missed his name, but he's a local guy that uh, he says if we can't kill any wolves, I should say this: if we, if we can't harvest wolves, then we should harvest everything else. How's that? That's a predator on the ambulance. So that was from one end to the other, I guess you might say. And I just told him, I said, it doesn't work that way. You know, there's always going to be predators. I mean, I said, you know, I said, he's, I told him to, to get involved and understand the, learn the biology of it because it's not as simple as it sounds. None of it. So eliminating one pre predator doesn't help the ungulates any, it just makes the other predator larger. And Alaska could tell you that. So. My answer to all those kind of people always is to get involved, figure it out. But it was kind of a disturbing phone call nonetheless. Yeah, thanks, Terry. Thanks for being our spokesperson to the public. We'll uh, <laughs> yeah. keep you on the phone lines more often. Well, I mean, I was surprised how many people were watching. Well, I only got two phone calls, but one represented three guys. Sure, sure, yeah.
Okay, Alex. And Sarah, you should have that new scenario in your inbox. I think I digested it correctly, folks. If I didn't, we'll make adjustments as needed. Thank you for working through lunch, Mike. I know we all appreciate it. No worries. Are you able to share your screen, Mike? I think it might take a while to get in my inbox. I can. Hold on. Let me open it up. Then you can point to things, too, if you need to. Okay, let's go ahead and attempt this. Okay, looks good to me. So Mike, would you mind just walking us through what you did and, and what's being shown here? Sure. Um, so based on um, what you guys suggested to the R1 or the FWP folks for what you wanted to see for a focal area, I did two scenarios that are a little bit different. Both of them are with a 10% population decline in 2027. So let's just start with the harvest prescription. That's 213 lions. Um, and our reference is 183. So we're up 30 lions or about a 16% increase in annual harvest that would be required to meet that 10% population objective in 2027. And then I looked at that allocation in our old region one focal area, um, which you see on the left here. And then this new proposed one that you guys came up with adding in LMUs 100, 101, 103, and 104. And I should have moved my little bubble over here for the gray, but I forgot to do that. So what you're seeing there on the right is that we're now, if you look at the density in the red zone, under your new proposed, it's 2.20. That's what we set it as our target to be similar to the Missoula management area. When we do that in this complete red zone, that only leaves us with 32.6 lions to put in the remainder of the gray zones proportional to habitat. So what you're seeing um, is quite a reduction from this 112, which would be a density of 1.5 lines per 100 square miles, down to a density of 0 0.84, which would be um, under this new alternative. And that's simply because, you know, we have a smaller pool to play with than we did at minus 15. We have fewer lions because we're harvesting less, and we've bumped up that you know, focal area to be quite a bit larger. Does anyone have any questions there? Mike, would it be helpful to put side by side the status quo with where we are currently just to compare? I can try. Questions for Mike about this or reactions? Mike, can you hear me? Yeah. What would, now that we have a larger focal zone, if that did go to 15%, is there an easy way to determine what that would look like? Or would that be a real hard task? If what went to 15%? Say you kept the, the lion at the population objective 15%, but you had that red focal zone now, the alternative B for region one focal area. I was just curious what that would look like 
I, I would have to recalculate those numbers, but I could do it. Um, okay. I, it, not if it's a big deal. I just thought that would be, it, it's a lot nicer now that we have a bigger focal plane to, to work with what that would look like as well. I, I think you can um, partially understand at this point with these sort of numbers and focal zones we've been playing, like you, we, the harvest in that focal zone would stay the same at 124.7, right? Yeah, yeah. But at, um, let me just open up that sheet. Um, <clears throat> Even if you're just close for the game. Yeah, but so, We're at 232 lions instead of 213. Yeah. So we've got another, what is that? 29, is that, or 19? Got another 19 lions under. Um, On the gray area. That yeah, know. that would be added to this 32.6. So, you you know, if, it, just to make the math easy, you, you could think about that as another 20 lions and you'd be up to 52.6 lions. Okay. Oh, Jerry, your hand is up. Go ahead. Well, I just, first of all, I don't think we should consider any of that with the red there on that. But, but if we do... One on one's 50 miles from Libby. It has nothing to do with it. It's Pinkham Creek. It's five miles from my house. And I live in Eureka. So I don't know why that's being considered anyway. Um, you know, 100 is split in two. I get that. And 104 is theirs. I get that. And, uh, and 102 is, I don't know, where, I, 103, I guess, is partially both. I don't know. Mostly Kalispell, I would think. Um, but uh, anyway, I'm just throwing that out there, you know. So it was uh, 101 that you were suggesting should be. Well, I mean, I, it's, it's Eureka District. It's nothing. To, it might be in Lincoln County. It might be part of what he's thinking, but it's nowhere near where those guys are. Thanks, Terry. Uh, Timothy. Uh, well, first off of that, I think. Josh would have more inputs on 101, but I'm, I'm not for necessarily 101, nor gets it. That wasn't my conversation. But separately, if we're looking at the alternative B at 32.6, and that gives us a rate of 0.84 per 100 miles, per mile squared, uh, the difference between 0.84 and I think where you're showing earlier the uh, <clears throat> point 0.1 or 1.0, which is what we were stable or current at or whatever, is only eight lines. So I don't think that point 0.084 is much of a concern. And if it is, it's, it's just eight lines. I could go either way on that. I like alternative B as it is, uh, like I said, with the exception of the discussion on 101. <clears throat> Neil, I see your hand. Go ahead. I was just going to point out that, so if you allocated those remaining 32, 33 lions among the gray areas, that's about five lions per LMU. Thanks for that, Neil. Good information. So would that result in potentially an increase in the population in the gray areas? I think the status quo is currently six, roughly. I think the status quo is five. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to, I guess, answer Terry. The, the reason I proposed those four hunting districts was simply the same reasons that they, uh, for the for the uh, Thompson Falls areas, just the, un, the ungulates, it's not necessarily just the human conflict. Um, the, the mule deer, so Neil mentioned earlier, the, the best mule deer areas in Northwest Montana are those, those particular districts. So it's, it's just for the ungulates primarily. And 
hopefully it would help with the human conflict around Libya and Troy as well. One thing to keep in mind, guys, you look at that giant white area, which is a Flathead Indian Reservation, there's not a single lion being taken that I know of off those areas. And also, obviously, if we add in like Glacier National Park and those type of things. So there will be some spillover in that. So are, are there things here that make or break this alternative for people? That was kind of where we left things before lunch was wanting to see this to see if it uh, satisfied the deal breakers and the deal makers for folks. Um, I'd like to hear what people think about that now that they've seen it. Yeah, I think, I think trying to target that large local area just leaves the rest of that zone, you know, um that that's not good management to wail on one place and don't kill anything in another i think good clean small incremental changes in the right direction which is to is to up harvest objectives decrease that population by 10 percent um in that original uh, r1 focal area alternative a uh, looks looks really good thanks Stacy. Now, I would disagree. I think that, uh, one, based on the, that we're up there in those communities, that we're seeing that from a different perspective, I think, and you're not necessarily living in those communities, but also that the 100 specifically has a high population density. And like we said, the 101 has a mule deer ungulate population that we're trying to assist and promote there. And yeah, we're getting, uh, oh, and we're calling to increase uh, harvest objectives by 10% in all of those areas. Okay, Terry, your hand is up. Okay, I mean, I want to know from Josh and Tim, either one of you, have you ever been in 101? Have you ever been there physically? Uh, yes, I have. Okay. I mean, you know, there's there's not that many mule deer there to begin with for a long time. They're trying to do something about that. One of the things we're trying to do is uh, Ethan's going to, our biologist is going to make a proposal to go do the same scenario we're doing a 109, which will help the mule deer dream tremendously. And uh, I'm, I'm all for that between you and me. I mean, I'm, I think hunting running mule deer, we're the only state in the union that allowed to hunt running mule deer without a, this is a whole other conversation, without a lot allowed to hunt running mule deer without a draw tag. But um, so, you know, that's one of the things I want to talk about that, but I just, I don't see why, first of all, I think it, if you take one-on-one off there, you guys, well, I'm not going to vote for that scenario anyway, but if you take one-on-one off there, you, you, you make that white a little bit more even. I'd also speak to like, um, Josh and Timothy, what were you guys seeing in the, in the late 90s, 2000s, in those areas. What, what, um, in your experience, where were the lion populations at during those years? The ones that you were pursuing and, and seeing. Do you have in your little four? They're in the high mountains. They weren't down in the valleys where they are today. But some of that is because of the population density as well that we have today. But what was your perce perception of the trend from that point to now? On, on all of region, all of 104, I'm not speaking this specifically to those uh, deals. What, what did you see in 2000 in, in 104? What was your experience and all the lines you caught in 104? I, I think you're asking a different question I'm, I'm speaking to. I'm not talking about lions caught. I don't hunt lions. I'm talking about lions in town. I'm talking about lions outside of town in the communities within two miles of town. The mountain lions were in the mountains whenever in nineties and two thousand. They're not. They're down. In the no, mountains. they won't. 
They weren't. Go look at homicides uh, by FWP during the 90s and the 2000s. There was plenty of cats killed in the suburbans. Okay. What I'm trying to make the point here is that that I don't believe you accurately have your finger on the pulse of what is taking place in 104 today or what happened 10 years ago or what happened 10 years before that. And, you know, your supposition that because you're seeing a mountain lion eating a suburban deer is a case of an overpopulation of mountain lions on the landscape is just not correct. And so, um, I mean, un unless you make them all extinct, period, okay? Like the option, if you want to kill a mass mountain lion, you won't see any deer left in town. But those deer in town have always been in town. They will continue to be in town as long as the deer are in town. And, and, and no matter how many you kill out of Libby Creek and Bear Creek and the West Kootenai, it's just not going to affect that urban mountain lion population. All right. So, so I understand that you feel that I don't have my finger on the pulse. And I would argue that I feel the same, that you don't have your finger on the pulse of what's going on in the 104. But also the mountain lions were not in town 20 years ago. They were, the Timothy. <laughs> they, they always have been. To, um, maybe we can put some more numbers to this conversation. So, Mike, I'm wondering if you could remind us what the difference we're talking about, the total difference in harvest here is between the 10% and the 15% objective. Um, is that the 19 number that you mentioned? Just so we have an understanding. Before we yes. go on, Alex, maybe I, maybe I can help weigh in on this, this urban lion discussion. No, actually, Casey is really accurate. Lions have been in urban areas. I think the difference that we're seeing now is that people have game cameras um, and other ways of actually seeing lions that normally they wouldn't have. We do not get a ton of urban wildlife calls from Libby. We get some, but no more than any other area in Montana, which has deer or whatever that are in, in, in adjacent to areas. Most of those areas, um, lions are not in conflict. They're probably moving through. So if conflict is happening, we're not getting a lot of reports of it. There are some, um, and typically those are habituated type lions that are hanging around schools and, and, and very visible during the daytime. Um, but just having a lion move through town is not necessarily conflict, and it's not up that unusual. We see it in whitefish, Kalispell, Eureka, wherever we're at. Thank you for that extra info there. Um, I, yeah, I do want to get Mike to give us those numbers because I, I think we're, um, well, I won't speak for them, but they, the differences that we're, we're, we're stuck on here might be a little bit smaller than they seem, I think. So Mike, can you, uh, can you refresh us on what the, the total difference in harvest that we're talking about at the eco region level is here? Yeah, at, at the 15% objective in 2027, our annual harvest is 232 lions a year. So we've to go to the 10%, we've dropped it down 19 lions and we're at 213 per year. Okay, thanks for that, Mike. I don't know if that adds any helpful context or not, but I just wanted to um, get that information back out there. Joshua, did you have your hand up? I see it's down now, but go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say the alternative B, you know, when I proposed that that focal area was not to enrage anyone. Um, I'm just trying to find a, a way to get to where I feel uh, the number will effectively meet the objectives. And I just didn't feel like 10 percent uh, reduction in those particular areas was going to get us to where I felt like we were even meeting the objectives. I feel like that's virtually that's, that's just not a very significant impact on the ungulates. Uh, to, to only be at 10%. That's all. My comment there too, I think 
you know, what I was trying to reiterate though is that like for example 2020 uh, worked on the lion study Libby downtown center of Libby was in the the uh, monitoring area and so at the time in all of the surrounding uh, portion and then north up along the reservoir all that was in and it, it's just not overpopulated not in a in a in a in disproportionate way is there lions living running around in bear creek and back in there in granite creek and all the country and and uh yeah of course there is um but it's not disproportionate it's it's uh um, it's not disproportionate from anywhere else. I think if you looked at the sample uh, locations within that, you'd see that. But I guess I'm trying to make my point is that I, I've been in all of that kind of a lot of days in all that country, specifically looking for individuals, specific looking for mountain lions and, and all of it, not just the good roads because we're working the study. So we're, we're hiking drainages, we're snowmobiling through country we know there isn't anything in it. and it is not as saturated as what you guys think it is it just isn't Terry, yeah go ahead well uh, you know i want to say one thing on that too and in, 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 from from hunting from guiding lines for 30 years and from and i and this is kind of a thing it's almost in favor of the wolves too i will say this that just because you see a, a lion track on on a road system and you go around over a little little ways over to the next road system you see a lion track a lot of times those are the same lions and people don't realize how much they travel especially when they're hunting or breeding and and so just because you see you know the same uh several lion tracks in one area that are a lot of times single lion tracks just so you know from hunting them sometimes a lot of times those are the same lions working in an area no, not, I'm not talking to you seeing two or three together with family group. I'm just talking. So, it's just, so I'm, I'm just trying to make everybody understand that sometimes it's not what you think it is. And I think Grover could probably weigh in on this as well, because he's done a lot. He's done more line studies than any of us. So, but they're speaking not, to that, Terry, to add, Terry, to add to that is that I can also go out in, in region 100, for example, on some winter range, and find seven mountain lions yeah. working on a herd of a deer and elk. Okay, that represents 100 square miles of summer range, okay, where those seven or eight mountain lions or 10 or 12, whatever there is, would be spread across that 500. So it's disproportionate to say that, that just because I can go find um, lions in, in a, a super dense area, um, right now during the winter months doesn't mean that there's a that there's so many lions that they are uh, negatively impacting a, a deer elk herd exponentially i'm not saying they don't affect them i absolutely they do but we see in it especially right now in the study area we're working in right now there is lions there's there's five thousand head of deer and elk living within a you know about a 12 mile stretch okay and you go in there and a lot of different individual lines were, were capturing and then recapturing, okay? But you'll spend 20 days hitting cells in the rest of the area that in December had slum. And now, I mean, I'm literally, we're picking up one or two lions a month of, of let's say 30 days of effort searching those other cells, okay? So everything moves to that spot. So if I went with a hunter one day and I went to that road, and I seen eight lion tracks, you know, I would think, oh man, the lions are thick in this country. Well, no, they're thick on this road today, but that's not representative of the entire eco region, if that makes any sense. I still just wanted to add to that though, this, this, we're still talking, we're still talking, inducing our population, you know? So we're still, we're still agreeing to what everybody wants to see, which is uh, reducing numbers of mountain lions in the landscape and uh, to help deer and elk. And um, so um, this isn't like we're asking for an increase. This is just a current, a more subtle approach, like a more uh, incremental approach um, towards this rather than a drastic fast approach that may require drastic changes the other direction down so so 
we have a couple of options for going forward. We, we talked about um, before lunch that we could, we, we can recommend a range. This group can recommend a range from 10 to 15% if, if there isn't, um, if we aren't able to come to an agreement on a specific number. Um, we can do another poll to uh, try to capture where everyone's at, what's a deal breaker for people right now. Um, I would, yeah, I'd like to hear from the group if anybody wants that information, if anybody is, is, uh, is, is feeling like they wanna put forward a recommendation, um, we have a couple options there. Um, it would be great if we can all kind of find a way to tweak the objectives or the LMUs such that everyone's satisfied, but, um, you know, I think we, we all acknowledge from the beginning that, that we might not be able to make everybody happy. So, um, or at least we can, can maybe make everybody unhappy. That might be a victory itself. But um, um, yeah, so we have a few options here for going forward. So um, would folks like to do a poll uh, about where we're at now? Was that helpful last time? Or do we think we know? What exactly would we be polling? So we've got the 15% the option, we've got the 10% option alternate A, and we've got the 10% option alternate B there. Get a sense for who's, who's supporting what. Or conversely, who, who couldn't live with what. Conversely, who, who couldn't live with what. So there we see again, yeah, the harvest difference from 15 to 10 being uh, 232 for 15 and 213 for 10. Does anyone have any thoughts now, now just seeing those total numbers? My recommendation, I don't think all of us are going to come to agreement. So your idea of going between 10 and 15% to the commission gives them, it, it gives our recommendation somewhere in there, or you, I'll split it right down the middle. But I would say either population objective negative 15% alternative B or negative 10% um, with it didn't seem like a bunch of the guys wanted the big red zone up north so alternate a of 10 percent would be my two choices for vote i i didn't hear a bunch of people against the big red zone up north i'm not sure who might be against that i think you have three or four guys that are against that but i we just have to take it to a vote at some stage, guys. I would propose that we could, considering all these options so we can get all the opinions down and give that to FWP and the commission um, to make sure that everyone's voices are heard because we don't want anyone to walk away from this feeling like they're pinned in a corner or not heard here. So that's um, just one reason to maybe go with all the options as we talk about who can live with it and who can't live with it. and. Uh, see what those differences really look like. Josh Fletcher, go ahead. I haven't said much, I guess, but uh, I don't see a real huge difference between the minus 10 or the minus 15. I would be okay with either one of them. And uh, I don't think it's anything if it's a little, the minus 15 is a little too much. I don't think it's anything we can't recover from. Um, I'm more comfortable with the minus 10 with uh, option B if we were to take out the uh, uh, 101 unit there on the east side of Lake Cucanusa. Thanks, Josh. Josh. Thanks, Josh. So I'm going to suggest that we all kind of similar to what we did um, before lunch, which is to take a minute 
uh, write down your top preferred most option and write down if there's any of these that you can't live with and then we can poll again. But I think, you know, Josh raises a great point, which is that this is, as others have said, an adaptive management program. So, you know, we're not setting the, uh, the future forever course of things here. So we can, uh, this will be revisited in six years. And, um, you know, knowing those numbers and the kind of small differences between them is, is important context here. Um, Josh Baltz, you have your hand up, go ahead. Uh, okay, last, last thing I wanna say is looking at these numbers again, the difference between 10% alternative A and 15% alternative B is only 20 more lions harvested across all of that gray area. Everything else stays the same between those two alternatives. Um, so that kind of makes me feel better about the 15% alternative B. It's, it's, not, it's not much of a difference there. Yeah, I think that's helpful um, because I was gonna ask um, the folks perhaps who said last time they weren't super comfortable or you know wouldn't be comfortable at all with either of these two scenarios if this context of 19 cats difference across either option really makes uh, you think about that in any kind of different way or not. Terry, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just want to, Josh, could you say that one more time so I could understand exactly what you're talking about there? Make sure I understand it. Sure I understand it. Yeah, so uh, alternative, our 10% alternative A, between that one and 15% alternative B is only 19 lion difference spread across the entire gray area. Everything else stays the same between those two alternatives. And I, I guess I like that better than the giant uh, focal area because that giant focal area makes it really, I don't know, seem kind of difficult for the remainder of the gray area. Okay, I get that. Thank you. Yeah, does anyone else have uh, updated thoughts as Sarah was asking now that you've seen the numbers? <laughs> Grover? Sorry, Grover, you're on mute. I kind of like 10% uh, and alternative A. I, I don't like that big, great big area of uh, red on alternative B. I, I, I think it's just too big an area. I, I personally like, I think you can do a better job managing if you do it in smaller areas where you can hit them harder where it needs it than less where it don't. So I, yeah, I like, I like 10% an alternative A. Thanks, Grover. Jason. I would be fine with either one of them. Appreciate that. Cody. Yeah, here's here's one other way to look at this too, guys. And, and I'm sorry to keep pounding this in, but you're looking at 19 lions. That's five years of harvest. That's 95 lions if the average mountain lions consuming 10,000 pounds of meat you divide that by 125 and you come up with 7600 deer so it is a big issue in my opinion i know it doesn't seem like much but that's a lot of ungulates so i'd argue court cody that 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 simple math doesn't it's it's not doesn't correlate exactly like that. I mean, no. I understand the concept for sure, but it, that's a oversimplification. It, it's it's the numbers from FWP what a mountain lion averagely harvests a year. So I mean, if there's better data out there, I would love to know. Um, obviously, I think it it could even be compounded because 
of all those deer that live, they're going to have offspring too. So I don't, I don't agree with you, Casey, on that, but. So Sarah just made a great suggestion, which is that we all take a moment, rank these three choices. So 15% alternative B, 10 alternative A, 10% alternative B. So take a minute, rank those, put them in the in your order of preference from one to three. And then um, if there's any that you can't live with, make a note of that as well. Um, so let's all take a minute and do that. And then we'll kind of come back and try to uh, uh, see where everyone's at. So I don't know if this will help anyone think about this at all, but if we look at the difference between the 15% reduction alternative B and the alternative A for the 10% reduction, we're, we're looking at a difference of 19 lions in the gray. If you were to break that down by the 10 LMUs, we're looking at something under two lions. It's like 1.72 lions per LMU difference between those two scenarios, just for reference, per year. Thanks, Molly. It helps to have that number. All right, folks. Well, I... I think the easiest way might just be for everyone to go around and, and share their choices uh, or their rankings and what they can't live with. Um, so if, if there's any objections to that, let me know right now. Otherwise, we'll just go into it. Okay, well, I'm just going to start in the order I see people on my screen. So Terry, that, that makes you first. Yeah, great. Great. So... Uh... You know, my first choice would be 10% um, alternative A. My second choice would be 15% alternative B. And did you have 10% uh, alternative B on there anywhere? Um, the B, I would probably do the 10% without 101 in the red for third choice. Thanks, Terry. All right, Cody, you're, you're next on my screen. Go ahead. So I am 15% B, negative 10% B, and third choice, negative 10% A. Gotcha. Any of those, sorry for both Terry and Cody, or any of those options, ones that you couldn't live with? Um. No, I could live with any of them. Thanks, Cody. Well, I wouldn't want to live with a couple of them, but I could. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. Thanks, Terry. Um, uh, okay. Uh, Jason, you're, you're next on my screen there. I can live with any of them. I went with uh, my first option was minus 15B. My second option was minus 10A. My third option was minus 10B. 
Thanks, Jason. Uh, Grover. Well, my first option was uh, 10% A, second one is 15% B, and uh, third one is uh, as uh, alternative A, 15%. Okay. But I can live with any of them too. Okay, great. And uh, Wally? Uh, first choice, 10% Alt A. Uh, second, 15% Alt B. And then 10% Alt B. Any of those deal breakers for you, Wally? No, I can live with any of them. I, if we go to 10% Alt B, I'd, I'd like to see that red zone shrink uh, like Terry had mentioned. Thank you. Uh, Josh Baltz. Fifteen percent Alt B. Ten percent Alt B. Ten percent Alt A. Um, I, I I can probably live with whatever the group ends up with on between those three. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Timothy. Ten percent Alt B. Fifteen percent Alt B. Ten percent Alt A. Any of those uh, untenable for you, Timothy? No, I think all three of them offer an increase in annual harvest density. Thanks for that. Casey. Uh, yeah, so the uh, first one would be a 10% A. Um, number two would be a 15% Alt B. And number three would be a 10% Alt B. <coughs> Any deal breakers there? Um, no, I think I'd live with whatever the group come up with. Thanks, Casey. Uh, Benny. Uh, 15% A, 10% A, and if I have to have a third one, that'd be 15% uh, B. Okay, and did you say the first one was uh, fifteen percent A. Yes. Okay. Just making sure. Um, any of those uh, no goes for you, Benny? Um, the far right. Ten percent B is a no go for you. Yeah. And I think uh, Josh Fletcher, you're our last person here. 15% uh, B, 10% A, and 10% B. Okay. Deal breakers, Josh? 10% um, B, unless we can take out that 101 district. Gotcha. <coughs> So I've heard a, um, you know, I've heard a couple of folks mention 10% B being deal breakers for those for whom it is. And Josh, you just said this, but um, if we were to remove District 101, would that become uh, no longer a deal breaker for you? Correct. And Benny, would that make a difference for you? Uh, would you say that again? So for 10% alternative B, if we took uh, District 101, which is the cursor's on right now, if we took that out of the red area and returned it to the gray area, would that alternative still be untenable for you? No, that's about the only area that I'd want red. Okay, gotcha. Was, it, was anyone else, I forget, was anyone else uh, unhappy with, there was someone else who was unhappy with 10B. 
maybe it was Terry who wanted that district out. Is that right? It was me. I'd like 101 out of there. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so we've got a, a range of, of options here. There's a few folks for whom B sounds like it won't work, and we've got some conflicting reasons why that's so. So um, would anyone be opposed to narrowing this down to just 15% alternative B and 10% alternative A as our, our kind of options here? That'd be fine with me. That'd be fine with me. So it sounds like if we are able to, to land on sounds like if we are able to. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. That's you talking. I think, okay, I was here in my own shadow. Uh, if it sounds like if we pick one of those, there won't be anybody who will be, uh, you know, totally unwilling to accept one of those. So that's great. We're in a good position there. Um, I know Sarah was was um, kind of keeping track of the scores there. I don't know if you did any of your famous Excel magic on that, Sarah, if that tells us anything, but if not, that's okay. I just was tallying up and we have um, five folks who all agreed 10A and then um, 15. And then we had three folks for 15 and then 10A basically, so. So it's kind of roughly evenly split there. Um, Do we want to take it to a vote? for those two different choices then, 15 alternative B and 10% alternative A? I think both those choices leave the LMU out entirely. So we'd really be without a vote dropping the LMU for the Northwest Lincoln County. Uh, I'm confused. Timothy, maybe you can um, expand on that a little. It's a little confusion there. Yeah, somebody just uh, made a decision to vote between the 15% and 10% that are otherwise identical other than the 19 line difference. But that leaves the conversation of the LMU completely out. And I think that's what we need to be discussing is, are we going to leave the LMU completely out for Lincoln County? And, when and you then say who's the stakeholders there? Uh, the, the portion of that conversation should be between those of us that are in Lincoln County. And so when you say leave the LMU out, do you mean turn it from red to gray? Or I just want to make sure we're understanding. Yes, both options that were just given leave Lincoln County gray. Gotcha. So I'm not sure if those that are in Lincoln County <clears throat> agree to that being made for them from outside. Timmy, it, it's pretty much the same amount of cats. If you, if you vote option fit the 15% alternative B, you're pretty much killing the same exact number of cats as you would if it was 10% uh, alternative B. I think it's important to note too that these are all increases in har in mountain lion harvest, so you're still you're still moving that direction with with every single one of these. So I'm in Lincoln County. Um, I, I I'm okay with uh, going away from the the focal area in Lincoln County as long as we end up with. 15% alternative B. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I guess uh, I guess I'd be okay with uh, trying to decide between 15% alternative B and 10% alternative A and see where that lands. Yeah, just to just to be clear, I, I, you know, I don't want to. If, if folks would like to retain 10% alternative B, we can. Um, I was suggesting we might remove that one from consideration since. Uh, several different folks said it was a kind of deal breaker for them, but for different reasons, which pointed to maybe it being difficult to kind of figure out how we could 
make a version of that that would work for everybody. Um, but if we need more discussion around that, that's okay. <clears throat> we can do that. I, I certainly don't want to be the one to make the decisions. I won't be. You will. Uh, Joshua, what are your thoughts on dropping the 101 out of there? Are you held firmly to keeping it or? Uh, I could live with that. Yeah. yeah. I think it was Benny, if I recall, who was wanted that one. Benny, if I recall. Is that right, Benny? Um, I'm sorry. Um, wanted which, where? Uh, that you were adamant that 101 should remain in the red for 10% alternative B. Is that correct? Um, yeah. Um, and well, I think it, it would help me to, to, to look at a region, region one map. Um, but one of my concerns is reducing lion or um, increasing lion uh, kill and reducing lion population in uh, chronic wasting disease area. I don't think it's gonna fly with the commission if they are up to speed with chronic wasting disease. And uh, so that's, that's one factor um, uh, that I have with that. Um, and then I, I spoke too quickly when I said that about uh, that Northeast corner of that huge red area. Um, I overspoke when I said that's about the only place that I would want it. Um, um, so strike that from, from uh, what I said. Okay, thanks for clarifying that, Benny. So then maybe we should have a conversation about um, removing 101 from that red area if, that, if that's a more effective compromise for folks. Does anyone have thoughts on that? Unfortunately, I kind of agree too with the chronic wasting disease. They want deer killed up there, unfortunately, in that region right around town there. Yeah, and hey, we are quite annihilating the white around it. And that is the Neil can the confirm this. Oh, never mind. Sorry. Sorry, let's get uh, let's get Joshua Baltz and then we'll get Benny. Well, I just wanted to say real quick, addressing the CWD, I, I know around Libya and Troy, we are literally annihilating the whitetails around town as part of the CWD. It's like unlimited tags. We are just mowing them down. So I, I don't know that. I mean, I think FWP's got that that plan under control. Thanks, Josh. Okay, Benny, go ahead. Sorry for that confusion there. Well, the disease extends uh, quite a distance out of town, you know, with moose on both sides of the reservoir um, testing positive, for example, you know, that's, that's pretty ominous. You know, it's, it's widespread around the area. It's not just in a cluster. Uh, I mean, we just have found it mostly in a cluster, but, you know, it's, it's wider spread than that. Uh, Timothy, I see your hand. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, I agree with the chronic waste disease issue, but I think the commission also has other tools available. Um, there's other predators out there, wolves, bears, humans, extra tickets, uh, extra licenses for CWD. So I think there's other ways to manage that other than through the mountain lion population. The mountain lion population might be a very small impact on all that. So what you're saying is that we're going to uh, reduce mountain lion population and uh, then uh, let the other predators uh, keep the population down? No, I'm saying we do not reduce mountain lion population. There's plenty of other predators that will keep that uh, CWD population down, including the ability to give more CWD licenses out, and those are being utilized. And so those efforts are already being attacked from other directions. Uh, having that conversation about CWD in 101 with mountain lions might not really be a conversation worth having. The impact is going to be very, very minimal. 
compared to all the other alternatives that are already out there that are focused directly on CWD. But you just said that you're not talking about reducing population of mountain lions, but I thought that's what this was all about. Not making 101 a focal area. I don't think the CWD problem is as localized up there as it is in Libby, right? I think you can't have it both ways though, because you just said that the, the lions are in town you know, if they're target, if they're the predator that targets the rural deer, which have the CWD problem, then why would you want to? You, you, I mean, you can't have it both ways. So, and if you're hammering on the deer that are in town, your lion problem in town is going away too. So, I, I don't see that correlation. I'm not sure what you're talking about. 103 and 101 are yeah, they don't even touch each other. I thought we we're talking about the CWD area there, but at Libby. In the 101. Sorry, yeah, I'm. I'm not sure what you're talking about. The uh, human conflict is in the 104 that I was discussing earlier today. The 101 and the 104 uh, do not connect with each other, so that's two different conversations. Tim Timothy, can I maybe? Uh, were you suggesting that you would be okay with removing 101 from the red in option B on the Tim? Is that what you're suggesting? Somebody else suggested that. My, I had never said either way on 101. I have no influence on 101. That's way up in Eureka. I think Terry would be better to talk to you on that or but something like that. I guess that's what everybody's wondering, though. You wouldn't have any heartburn either way, whether it was included or not. Correct. Okay. I'm not even involved in the 101 conversation. There you go. Thanks for that clarity, Neil. Um, so, okay, so we've talked, it sounds like we've, we've kind of come to a place where we could all stand 101 being removed from 10% alternative B. Does that change anyone's opinion? Does that move it up or down in anyone's rankings if we were to uh, remove 101 from 10% B? If it doesn't change anything, then we can kind of stick with what we were going with before. But if it changes something, we should talk about it. Yeah, Terry. It, it doesn't change anything with me, although I, if, if we go that direction, if it ends up one of the two we vote on, I want 101 removed, right? So Sarah can confirm, but I think our, our top two choices from the vote were either 15% B or 10% A. So if, um, you know, if, if changing the, this change to 10% B doesn't change anything, then we can just, you know, we, we, we checked it out, we investigated, but it doesn't change anything. So we can still move ahead to a vote between those two. That's my suggestion. And we did have two folks saying that 10B, it would be 15% and then 10B as their second rank choice. So if there's more people that would go to that side to say 10B actually looks good or more people that would leave that option, we can either move to that side a little bit or leave it behind. So I'm not hearing anyone pipe up that their opinion on 10B would change much, uh, even with the removal of 101. So I would suggest that we have a vote between 15B and 10A. I think that sounds good, Alex. And remember, we can, we can uh, share this process with the commission, let them know that there was uh, you know, support for both of these. Um, but I, I still think it'll be in our best interest to have one. So, um, yeah, I'm seeing some thumbs up. Any, any oppose uh, having a vote between these two? Uh, yes, I've vocalized that already. I'm opposed to having a vote between two that don't include the LMU and Lincoln County. Thank you, Timothy. What would, um, what would change your mind or what, what do you need to hear talk about to, to be in a place where you'd be willing to vote? 
I think that there's a heavy density in the 100. I think there's human conflict in 104 that are reason to meet our objectives of reducing human conflict in our initial coming in their initial object objectives. So if we are going to eliminate one of our objectives and not discuss human conflict, I don't know if anyone else has even mentioned human conflict and how we're going to affect that and how this affects that. So that's where hey, I see. Timmy, and my, my math might be wrong, but if you picked 15% objective, that's killing just as many cats as 10% alternative B um, in those areas. In fact, it probably does, takes more lions off the landscape, obviously in the whole eco region. So if you look at those numbers, just cause it's red doesn't mean it's not doing more lion harvest. And I guess is what I'm trying to have you look at. No, uh, the red puts it at 2.2 .2 per 100 miles squared, if, if you're looking at the same sheet here in front of us, whereas the white puts it down at 0.15. Yeah, but when you start talking the whole eco region, which we're supposed to be doing, that's, that's the number that is probably one of the most Im important numbers that you should be looking at. I mean, not think of it as an LMU, but think of it as the whole eco region. That's one third of our charge. The LMU is also one third of our charge. So like I said, we're leaving out objectives and we're leaving out portions of our charge when we start going one direction, like you're asking. So we have a couple choices we can do. We can do the kind of ranked choice vote like we just did um, and kind of take the totals of those and look at what's the lowest total. We can uh, narrow it down to two options with some further discussion, see if we can rectify some of Timothy's concerns um, or move forward if not and, and, and note that those concerns were raised. Um, how, do, how would folks like to proceed? I think we re-vote and let the vote tell it and, you know, in, in same manner, let the vote, vote shut me up too, please. Thank you. <laughs> well, certainly don't want anyone to be shut up. That's the, that's the opposite of our goal here. So even if the vote uh, goes a different way, you know, we'll, we'll make sure your voice is, here, is heard and, and reflected in the report. Um, so why don't we do um, one more round of voting now that we've talked about making changes to 10B that remove uh, yes, 101. Oops. And, um, and then we'll look at the results of that. We'll sum them up and um, see how it shakes out. Uh, Joshua, go ahead. I'm sorry to do this to everyone, but I had one more idea. Well, what if we just made 100 uh, an LMU and added it to that 15%? seems like those numbers would be pretty close and pretty tolerable and we would get 100, uh, maybe a little bit more pressure on that population than 100. Um, just wanted to see what people thought about that. Uh, it won't hurt my feelings if you hate it. So that would be changing the uh, that area where the, the cursor is now from 1.81 to 2.2 .2, uh, per 100 miles squared. Is that correct? That per 100 miles squared. Yep. That's what I was thinking. I, I like that, uh, but, you know, I'm not trying to complicate this any further, uh, but I do like that thought. Other folks have thoughts to reactions to that. Yeah, I like that thought. If we we put it with the ten percent objective, I could live with that also. But I like it in fifteen better. <laughs> 
Yeah, would anybody, okay, so for 10A, is there anybody who would be opposed to uh, making 100 a uh, red area there? I can live with that. Okay, so just to be clear, what we're voting on now is 15B with the red 100, 10A with the red 100, and 10B with 101 changed from red to gray. <laughs> Does everyone understand that? I can repeat it if need or put it in the chat or, uh, oh, we might get a quick fix here. There we go. <laughs> Alex, could you clarify that? For me, because I thought, or Joshua, I thought what you were saying, Joshua, is that under the 10% alternative B, we, you guys just talked about um, removing 101 from that. Were you saying that you would like to make that just 100, so you would also remove 103, 104? Is that what you meant, or what did you mean? What did you yeah, you're tracking. I, I'm trying to get away from 10% alternative B, but to do that, I want to try to try to find something that Timothy can live with and, and also a good idea just there for 100 because we've got such high density. So yes, what I'm proposing is is getting one, getting rid of 101, 103, and 104 and just leaving the 100. And doing that as a part of 10% B, is that what you were thinking? So there's, in other words, there would be no. A, okay, that, that's I'm just a little confused about what the options are, and and out when Alex summarized, it wasn't what I understood. So I'm trying to figure out what you're talking. About. Yeah, no, again, yeah, just trying to get trying to get away from that ten alternative B and and adding adding a uh, focal area for unit one hundred. And and fifteen percent alternative B and ten percent alternative A. I can I can try to to state again, and folks can correct me if I'm wrong. So, what we're talking about for fifteen percent alternative B is what's shown on the screen, but with unit one hundred changed <clears throat> red. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And for 10% alternative A, we're now talking about what's shown on the screen, but with unit 100 changed to red. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And right. For 10% alternative B, we're talking about what's shown on the screen, but with 101 changed from red to gray. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Or did we want to, Joshua, did you want to just drop 10% B then? Yeah, if you're good with it, I think everyone would probably agree to just drop it now. So, so we can 10 drop percent A or 15 percent B with yeah. the, the red in 100. Does anybody want to keep uh, 10 percent B or can we drop that now? <clears throat> think we could drop that. All right, so we're down to 15B and 15A as pictured, but with red unit 100. So um, is everyone ready to vote on that? So we can go ahead and put your choices down and then we'll, we'll do a circuit one more time and, and we can record them and see what the total is. Sound good? So take a moment to think about that and, and make your choice, then we'll, we'll go with the results. Jason, yeah. I got one question, maybe I missed this, but I thought that focal area could eventually move anywhere in that region. Yeah. I'd say yes, once we leave the committee, the decision doesn't change. The Fish and Wildlife still have the responsibility of managing that. Um, these are recommendations, um, decisions that we're making as a committee, but when the population shifts because of our recommendations, the LMUs will continue to be managed by fish wildlife, by the biologists. Yeah, I think you could take this as a, the committee's making a recommendation on where to deploy those 
focal areas. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, that's fine. I just uh, reviewing everything how all day on minus 10%, you know, there there's focal areas on both of those and our only one without is alt A minus 15%. But I thought we we talked that uh, even though it was red, that it could be red anywhere in that gray area. And maybe okay. we've moved past that, and I just didn't, yeah. you know, didn't see that, and that's fine. Well, ultimately, that could happen. But I guess the way I would view this as a biologist or the wildlife manager is that the committee is recommending that you these are should be the focal areas for you to consider FWB. Okay, no problem. Yes, that was a conversation right before lunch. If anybody had any recommendations on what those red areas should be, <clears throat> which started with 100, 101, 103, 104, and 121. And I think now we're settled on 121 and 100 for the most part. Okay, has everyone cast their choice? And uh, we'll go in uh, reverse order this time. So, Josh Fletcher, what have you got? 10% uh, A for number one and 15% B for number two. All right. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Benny. Uh, hmm. <clears throat> Why don't you let me pass and I'll uh, come back <laughs> to me, okay? No problem. Circle back. Casey, I think at this stage, you can just say your top choice since there's only two. Uh, top choice would just would be that uh, alternate A with 10% uh, and 100. Thanks, Casey. Timothy. Fifteen percent. Josh Baltz. 15. Wally. 10% all day. Uh, Grover. 10% A. Jason. I've got 15 B. Uh, so I, oh yes, 15 B, great, great, sorry. Cody. 15 B. Uh, Terry. Alternate A, 10% with, with 100. And uh, Benny, are you good? Um, yeah, 15B. Oh. So Sarah, how did it shake out? A50. <laughs> half of for, for 15B and half for 10A. <laughs> Well, so 12 and a half. <laughs> yeah, that 0.5% will be tough to calculate. No. Um, okay. Well, so no clear, no clear winner there. Um, I think, uh, you know, we can talk about what to do next. Seems like one potential option is to just share that vote result with the committee and say that um, this wasn't, neither of these were a deal breaker. The committee was split between these two options exactly down the middle and have that be our recommendation. Um, that's one option. If folks would like to propose a different way forward, we can talk about that too. Um, we also wanna make sure to save just a little bit of time for any other kinds of suggestions or recommendations or language that you want to be sure is uh, included and um, and paired up with your uh, with your number here. So just bear that in mind. But um, yeah, how do folks feel about that suggestion? Would you like to go with that or keep talking about this and try to persuade someone from the other side? Any 
long couple of days. I know. Appreciate you guys <laughs> sticking with it here. I'd just like to highlight that we're still talking about a 19 mountain lion shift over an entire Northwest region, eco region. It's good perspective, definitely. Could split the difference in the gray area as well. It's another potential compromise there. Josh Bolts, see your hand. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think since we're split right down the middle, I'd, I'd be okay with just going forward with the recommendation, you know, 10 to 15 percent um, with these with these air, with these LMUs. So I, I'm okay with just saying 10 to 15. Another thumbs up to that from Josh Letcher. Yeah, I agree that uh, whether it's 10 to 15 percent or we understand it's 19 cats. Um, is there some place in the middle where we can meet and be okay with that? I know it asked somebody to give up 10 cats across the region, but is uh, a number like 221 or 12 and a half percent, 223, whatever that be. But is anybody opposed to that? State 12 and a half percent? Is anyone so firm on 15 that they don't want to give or so firm on 10 they don't want to give? All right, so anybody opposed to uh, splitting it down the middle there in the in what's available in the gray areas to go to twelve point five percent? Okay, well, I say we um, I think we've got our decision there. Maybe we can take one more quick break and then come back and. Uh, close it out for the day. Any last thoughts before we do that? Could you summarize that one more time for me, Alex? I just want to make sure I'm clear on what the right. Yeah. Is. So um, we have uh, decided to add unit 100 as one of the red focal areas. And I don't know what the number will shake out for that, but whatever it is, we can, you know, number that accordingly. And then um, have a 12.5% reduction for the eco region, um, which splits the difference between the 10% and the 15%. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, folks, well, let's reconvene in 15 minutes, so 45 <clears throat> after, and then we will finish out the day. Thank you guys for persevering through this. It's, it's great to have that number. So we're almost there. Thanks, everybody. See you in a minute.
I was as soon as you said that, that's where I went.
You work fast, Mike. I don't know. You might ask Neil the same question. <clears throat> Timothy, are you on there? I, I was going to tell you something. Tell me. I was going to explain to you, you know, in increasing uh, that quota is not going to help anything in town because the cats in town are transient cats. And by shoot, increasing the quota, you open up more territory and you you increase, increase the transient cats, not putting them down so I mean for me I just assume you shot them there because it makes people look good but it's it's not going to change anything as far as the cats in town it actually makes it worse it's like the special management unit I mean for years and years after they killed everything they could they had just as big a problem as before because cats are territorial and these transient cats are going to go where the open territory is and so, you know, you're still going to have a lot of cats in town. Uh, I mean, uh, the only way you can get away from them is shoot them all. So, anyway. I understand yeah. what you're saying, Grover. What's that? Uh, I understand what you're saying. But if you look at the, the 100 there's in red on the screen, the border yeah. of the 100 is the Kootenai River. And there's a lot of heavy water flow, more than the Clark Fork River, coming down through the Kootenai. But, but that doesn't bother cats at all. all right. oh, run every cat, right across every cat that we studied in the, in the Missouri breaks on the north side went to the south side. They swam back and forth all the time. And I can right, take one. Missouri one Okay. I can take one of, in the Ghost River in Alberta that we were on. I mean, it was the size of the Kootenai. It was flowing faster. And it had just it, about half of it was ice flowing down through there. And that cat didn't even hesitate. He jumped in and swam across. You know, one of them in, in uh, the break study had a satellite collar on it, and it swam the Fort Peck Reservoir where it was almost three miles across. So right. water still is no deterrent to cats at all. Right. And then you, you talk about transient cats, okay. and it's about where the transient cats transiting from. And well, as I said, for, if we're going to hunt the 100 and the 121, I'm fine with that. We're going to take the population from that region down a little bit. Yeah, the transient cats are probably going to come from Idaho. Folks, I'm just going to cut in here quickly to, to keep us on track. I want to make sure we, uh, we get through things and, and get to a finish point here. So um, I, I want to you know, start by just uh, celebrating a little that we got. We got a number. That's great. That was kind of the primary goal of all of this, or one of the primary goals along with all of the um, discussions that have come with it. Um, so for the next step here, um, we're actually gonna pull back up the problem statement that you guys put together in the first session. You asked us, uh, you asked Sarah and I to kind of give it a little bit of light revision and, and we haven't had a chance to share that with you up to now. So we wanted to just show you those revisions and make sure that this problem statement still reflects the way we're all thinking about this and make sure that we solve the problem that we set out to solve. So um, we just wanted to put this up on the screen, give everyone a chance to look at it. The edits we made are in red and blue. Um, so yeah, just take a look here and um, take a minute or two to read through this. And then if there's anything that we need to change or talk about, we have the time to do that. Um, and then we'll move into the, the last part of this, which is talking about what happens next. So let's start here and then um, we'll give you a minute and we'll talk about it.
Okay, anybody wanna comment on or change anything or reflect on this statement after all we've gone through now? Maybe the first question is whether uh, these changes that we made are, are okay with all of you. We just tried to keep it really light and make sure we retained everything you guys put in there. I think those changes, you know, they retain the, the sentiment of the statement. So it looked good to me. Looks good to me. More thumbs up there. Yeah, it looks good to me. It's good with me. Folks would we'll be happy sharing this as it's written. Anybody want to change anything or add or subtract anything? Okay, well, um, that is, uh, that, that is easy. <laughs> so I think, um, yeah, that's, that's good. So, um, you know, the next thing I think we can talk about is um, just what happens next in this process and um, where this goes from here and in what ways you all can stay involved. So um, I'm actually going to invite Brian to speak a little bit about that, and then we can have some question and answer and discussion around that. So Ryan, why don't you walk us through the next steps here? You bet. Thanks, Alex. And thanks, everybody, for all the work you've put in on this. Um, so the department uh, clearly thinks that this is a, a critical step, a critical, or we wouldn't have put this, this group together in the first place. And um, it, it's in line with, um, and it was lined out in 2019 in our, our Lion Management Plan that we would use this approach and we would use an eco-regional planning team to do that. And so um, what our intent from this point forward is that we're gonna use this product and this will guide the recommendation that the department ultimately formulates. Um, our intent is going to be to use this and, and formulate the harvest uh, that we intend to, to obtain. Um, the region will look at it. Uh, they'll they'll take that this this document and the and the input. Um, you know, obviously, um, Region One and Region Two have been involved in this. Uh, you know, Liz has been part of this. Uh, Neil's been part of this. Uh, you know, uh, several other of the biologists have been here. Uh, Franz has been here. Uh, obviously, Mike's been deeply involved. So everybody's that's that this influences has been very deeply involved with this. Um, from the whole process. And so I think not only do they, will they be familiar with the product, but they also will be largely familiar with the, uh, the intent and kind of the scope of um, the uncertainty that I think everybody feels with this. So they're gonna formulate a recommendation and that recommendation uh, will be influenced by the structure that the commission ultimately adopts. Um, the commission, you know, and that's why we, we, we wanted um, this group to tell us what the direction was and, and how far to move it in that direction and where we wanted to emphasize things. But the commission ultimately establishes the structure um, and uh, they're, they're still working on exactly what that's going to look like. But as Neil indicated earlier, regardless of what structure that they, they choose, um, we are going to do our absolute best to formulate a, a recommendation under the structure that they have and um, use that to try to target this, uh, the, the objective that, when I say this, I mean the objective that you've um, collectively have put together. Um, our intent is to keep this in place for the next six years and we'll, we'll be coming back um, basically in about four years to start um, re reinvestigating 
and using the seeker estimate, um, the spatially explicit capture recapture approach to try to look at how well we did. Now, what you've given us is a pretty precise 12.5%. I was thinking 12.473 would have been better, but we'll go with 12.5. Um, but, uh, you know, with that level of precision, um, admittedly, you know, th there's a little bit of this that kind of feels like we're, you know, doing the classic measuring something with a micrometer, marking with a grease pencil, and then firing up the chainsaw to cut it. Um, we recognize that what we're doing is going to be less precise than, than what we're hoping for. But this is going to help us evaluate our ability, number one, our, the, the functionality of our population estimates. It'll help us evaluate uh, how we're using our integrated population model that will help us kind of monitor things in between those seeker estimates. Um, but those two things together will help us monitor and, uh, and determine whether or not we can achieve the objectives we want with our, with our populations. Um, the commission certainly has the prerogative to change things along the way. Even if they do, those changes that they make or uh, the lack of precision on our ability to actually implement uh, a harvest that we're hoping to attain, all of that's going to help us. Um, we're still going to be able to measure that. Uh, we're still going to be able to evaluate how our, um, our monitoring protocols are working. And it's our intent to follow that, um, that model and uh, that, that uh, when I say the model, uh, the strategic plan that was put together on mountain lions and uh, continue to do that uh, throughout time. You know, next one will be uh, in the Southwest. Uh, then we'll move to central Montana and then we'll come back uh, to, to the Northwest again and evaluate that. So we will be presenting um, what the, uh, <clears throat> we'll take what the region prepares, run it through um, our internal processes, get it through the director's office and ultimately prepare something for the commission. Our first presentation to them will be on April 19th. Um, and uh, the presentation will be by the wildlife division. It may be myself or it may be Ken McDonald that's ultimately presenting that. Um, and at that meeting, the commission should, the way things are scheduled now, they may select, they should select a final season structure. And we will be offering our proposed quotas at that point in time. Um, then the way the plan is currently is at our June commission meeting, the commission will be acting on the final quotas and adopting those um, at any of those commission meetings or before um, there will be an opportunity for public comment. And I would, uh, as uh, several of you have done at previous commission meetings, um, I, I would encourage you to, um, to share your perspectives with the commission, let them hear what you're thinking and um, let them know that you've been part of this, this working group and if, if you believe that this has been a worthwhile process, um, you know, certainly your testimony to that would be, would be welcome. If you think there's things we could do better in the future, you know, please let us know that. And uh, um, you don't hesitate to share that with the commission as well. Um, so that's kind of the process from here forward. Um, questions anybody may have on those, on, our, on those steps. Let's just hope the commission has as many questions when we present it. <laughs> I have a question just to clarify, Brian. Um, so is there, is this, what this committee has come up with in terms of their recommendation to us, is that, are we going to draft something up and present that to the commission separately from our season recommendation, or is it going to be incorporated into the season recommendation that FWP makes to the commission? So are there are two separate things that the commission will get. Um, so any report that comes out of this will, um, will wind up being a support material um, that we will share with the commission um, as we move forward. But 
Um, the likelihood is that this will be a single presentation, a single um, uh, document or a single recommendation that we make to the commission um, regarding what the, uh, the harvest objectives would be. And then when I say harvest objective, um, you know, we know that um, what, we're, what we're talking about is the targeted harvest. So if we're using, um, you know, special licenses, you know, we'll be still targeting a harvest with that. We know that it's not 100%. If we're talking about an open, uh, over-the-counter uh, hunt, um, we would have an, a quota established that would go along with that. And so <clears throat> that would all be encapsulated in our quota recommendation, uh, but the, any report from this would be provided to the commission and uh, as support, and we would certainly acknowledge the effort during the course of our presentation. Um, uh, but the commission has tended to uh, look for um, some pretty succinct presentations. Uh, there has been some discussion that they might consider um, a work session prior to the commission meeting. If they do that, uh, then we would probably give this a little bit more detail in that situation. Um, but if, they're, um, if we wind up just presenting it at the uh, commission meeting, it would probably be a pretty succinct presentation. questions for Brian or any of our other FWP folks while we've got them here. Terry, yeah, go ahead. Well, I just maybe it's just a question of something we're going to discuss later for all of you, but there's a couple of things that came up with this that I thought were quite fascinating and Cody and Casey and Joshua, a few guys brought it up is the fact that when you guys are doing, uh, doing areas where you, and I don't know how it's worked in the past, but, and I, when you're doing areas of mule deer studies or when you have winter range mule deer, winter range sheep, I'd like to see, make sure you guys have the ability to, if those guys get in trouble by any predator, when they're vulnerable on winter range, calving range, you know, lambing range or whatever, to be able to go in there and, and maybe eliminate a few predators, make sure that doesn't happen. If we're going to help those particular animals, then I think that ought to be one of the formats that you guys are able to do that it has nothing to do with what we're talking about here. But, but I just think that that ought to be brought up somewhere and you guys ought to be given that power. That's one thing I want to bring up. Um, the other thing is, is, um, you know, over the years, I've taken out a lot of, of the problem lines for the fishing game, um, all the way to Browning and uh, which wasn't you guys, but um, including Glacier Park. Um, one of the things that I've known five times in my career, I took out lions during the kill season when we, you know, and I wish you guys had a, you know, couple of one time, especially we got a very large tom. Well, I'd like you guys to have the abilities. And I know it's always been something they don't want to deal with in the past, but I'd love to be able to call guys with tags in those moments and, and have those things be, be harvested with the tag during the, when it's a uh, legal season. And we just never have done that before. And I just thought I'd throw those two things out there. It's just something I thought, I've thought about for a long time. Well, folks, we're just, we're kind of closing in on the end here. And, um, you know, we've, I want to, I want to applaud you guys for the hard work that you've put in. This has been amazing. And I'm really impressed by everyone's ability to think through all of this and think from different points of view and, and maintain a respectful dialogue through all of this. So um, great job to all of you, but um, we have a little bit of time left to discuss. Um, Anything else that might be on folks' minds? One, one important thing that I think we just want to make sure we, we have on our list is if there's any parking lot items that um, folks want to be sure are, are captured in this process. So 
Um, you know, Terry, you just brought up the kind of uh, broader predator management, which I know has come up a few times, and we've definitely got that, um, you know, right at the top of the parking lot. But if there's other um, uh, discussion or question or issues that people want to bring up, this is this is a good chance to do it. Timothy, go ahead. Yes, we'd uh, brought forward some parking lot items to carry forward in January. Can we review those to make sure that we still have uh, the same agreement understanding and that they're still somewhere being pushed forward? Yes, I think I'll uh, deploy Sarah to dredge that up for us and share her screen if that's okay, Sarah. Yeah, I was looking at these just a few minutes ago and I'm thinking that I would guess some of these are um, a little out of context now that we are where we are, but um, take a look at, this is from the last meeting. And if you want me to carry anything onto this meeting's um, final parking lot, I can copy and paste that over. Do we have an objective target number for the lion population? Is that as simple as taking that 1400 number or 1300 number and reducing it by 12.5% or if that's if that could be captured somewhere else or at least captured in the parking lot going forward, what that is, if we've answered that question or have a good idea of where that is. See a thumbs up from Mike. Mike, do you want to comment on that? I think, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Timothy's spot on. We do have that number and it's simply, um, it's simply applying the math of our population objectives to our reference year. It was just easier for the discussions today to talk in those, you know, plus 10% stable, minus 15, minus 30. And um, so we stayed in those areas, but um, as Timothy suggested, that math works out. Thanks, Mike. And we'd also requested a table to compare and contrast lion density versus status of perceived struggling ungulate populations. We might have already moved too far beyond that, but I don't know if somebody prepared that, if, if that exists for a request or if that was um, an oversight. Any FWP folks want to comment on that? I think we covered some of that in that original presentation where um, sort of indirectly, at least where we were looking at the um, habitat quantity of RSF values that are greater than 0.75, which is highly correlated with density. Um, struggling ungulate populations and, and how to map that out, I think is a more difficult question. And I might let Neil or, or um, another FWP representative weigh in on that. No. no, Mike, I think you have it right. And it kind of goes back to that conversation we had earlier about when you asked if we could pinpoint, you know, where, where would we apply those focal areas in? So yeah. It all comes down to your definition of struggling and what that means. So it's a little bit more difficult to do that in terms of a, a table. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that answers your questions, but it, it's a bit more challenging than folks might think. So 
So if you like, as, I as, go ahead, Timothy. As far as concern, is the current population too small? I think we can delete that. I don't think that needs to go forward. Let you me want to object to that. Let me do something Just a real quick. Question, I think. I'm going to show you the, you know, when you can see two side by side here. Um, so on the left, this is from our first meeting. And on the right is the kind of final notes I'm preparing from this meeting. So this is something Alex and I were just kind of um, fleshing out from previous conversation yesterday and today and um, kind of the other things we thought we heard you trying to carry over. So is this side on the right accurately reflecting your ideas of what you want to make comments to have to be in the commission? And if yes, or is there anything on the left side from last meeting that you think we should pull back over to the final list that we sent forward? Because yeah, some of these things probably are a little bit um, outdated or have been talked about enough to leave behind perhaps, maybe not. That's Sarah, that looks like a great way to organize this. I'm personally satisfied with everything you have on the right. I don't know if anyone else has any issues, concerns, talking points. Is this recommendations for the commission, correct? Yeah, the idea is that, um, and I'll be sending this document to the FWP folks who can add anything else they think we need to add to that, um, who can then share it with you guys as the final document. And you can make recommendations to FWP and the commission or one or the other, I think too, if you think something is more appropriate to one or the other. Would this be the document that you could place uh, having a sheep area, areas where the bighorn sheep populations in, is in the decline that you could have possible mountain lion opportunities for helping the sheep population recover? Like that. Yep. Cody, did you want to add mule deer to that too, or just leave it a lot as sheep? I think mule deer, and I mean, you could print the seas ungulates but one of their big focus is on that sheep herd down by there's two different sheep herds um 121 and 122 but, yeah. but I, I think the two most popular ones to that would probably be bighorn sheep and mule deer you're right Is there anything we could place in there to, I, mean, I see that you have the broader, especially wolves need broader predator management, but in areas, in areas of ungulate decline, we need more liberal wolf and bear seasons so that we're not just targeting one mountain lines. Say that last part again, broader wolf and other predator management seasons. Wolf and bear harvest opportunity.
is everybody in agreement with that? I don't want to say something that not everybody agrees with. Sounds like uh, everyone's with you, Cody. Anything else you'd like to be added over to this set of recommendations? FWP folks, any questions or points or clarity that you guys need? Thumbs up from Mike. Thanks, Mike. Well, folks, I think that kind of brings us to the end of our scheduled programming here. Um, we clearly have time left on the agenda. If folks have more questions, concerns, comments they'd like to raise over here, um, let's just give a, give a moment for that and make sure that, uh, that we have the chance to talk about it all while we're all together. All right, uh, Mike, you've got your hand raised, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to <clears throat> thank the group. A um, lot of knowledge, a lot of passion, a lot of different opinions and a difficult process, but um, a really cool process. And I feel lucky to have been involved in it and um, appreciate all the hard work and um, getting to the decision. I think it was really good. And, and thanks to Alex and Sarah for being able to negotiate all this. Um, it went really smooth. I think same goes to the biologists. I thought you guys, everybody was super well prepared. Alex, Sarah, same to you. So thank you guys. It's been an honor to uh, to go through this with all of you guys, and I, I, I share Mike's sentiments and gratitude. Um, it's just been a, a great experience and a great outcome. So really all credit goes to all of you. Um, Casey, you, you can go ahead. Uh, I just was uh, you know going to say that same thing, just grateful and, and respect each and everybody's perspectives and, and grateful that uh, to be a part of it and be able to, to walk through the process has been a, a um, even though tedious at times, I'm grateful for it and thankful for everybody that's, that's uh, stuck in there. So thank you for everybody. Yeah, definitely. Jason? I was just going to say the same thing. Uh, appreciate everyone's time. Good comments. Learn something every day. Thanks for everything. Yeah, thank you all. I mean, you're all troopers with this. It's yeah, it's not no. easy to do over Zoom in particular. And so um, sitting through four days of Zoom meetings is not something anyone would probably wish on anyone. So great job um, going, getting through that. And yeah, this process itself, we've done it a lot of different times. It's never an easy one, but I'm glad to hear that um, it seems like it was a productive one for all of you. And it seems to definitely be from my angle too. So great work. Yep, thank you. Like Mike spoke for everybody. Yeah, I mean, committing four days of your life to this is... <laughs> No small ask. So thanks you very much for sticking with it and, and getting through this process. You guys did a great job. Well, your, your reward is uh, 
getting out early. So that's a testament to how great it went. So um, once one last time, thanks to everyone. It's been a huge honor and um, I really appreciate your, your time and effort. Um, this, this matters and it's made a difference and um, yeah, I appreciate it. So thank you all and hope to see you again, hopefully not on a screen next time. Let's, uh, let's hope and pray for that. So pray for that. So. With that, thanks and goodbye. Yeah.